Good morning. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm uh, the chair of uh, the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today, our committee is holding a joint hearing with the Committee on Health, uh, Mental Health, and Disability, and Addiction, chaired by my uh, esteemed colleague, Council Member Diana Ayala, where we will examine the negative mental health consequences of discrimination and bias uh, incidents. Broadly speaking, discrimination involves unequal action against uh, the, mis the mistreatment of some based on one or more of the actual or perceived characteristics. This can include someone's race, gender, ethnic or, or religion, identity, sexual per preference, age, disability, or immigration status. Discrimination can be overt, for example, using racial slur to arrest someone, or more subtle, in the latter case, the understate un nature of discrimination, discriminatory act, make it difficult to prove and therefore identify and label. Discrimination can also be structural in these cases, barrier to equal opportunities are embedded in institutions, social structures, policies, norms, and uh, attitude. Discrimination can also rise to the level of a hate crime. Hate crimes or bias incidents consist of two elements, an underlying crime, and a motivation by an unlawful bias that is uh, protected by hate crime laws. The bias motive is precisely what makes the, that crime distinct. The victim of hate crimes are selected as target to some actual or perceived protected characteristic, such as race, gender, disability, religion, or sexual orientation. As such, hate crimes are acted on an individual but target the broader group or class of people who share the protected characteristic. This can have a devastating psychological and emotional effect, and victims of hate crime are likely to experience psychological effect more strongly than victims of non-hate crime. Hate crimes also have a community impact. When an individual is targeted based on a protected characteristic, the group that shares this characteristic will often feel vulnerable to future attacks. This is because in hate crime, the attacker not only asserts power over the victim, but also asserts power over the community. Certain man marginalized community have long history of being victims of bias motivated violence and discrimination. When there is a little to no understanding of the sheer scope of the hate crime, social acceptance of discrimination persists, and these communities continue to be disproportionately vulnerable to hate crime. Discrimination, harassment, and bias, or hate crime, have a range of impact on a person's life and on their sense of themselves. Victims often internalize and normalize the behavior so that they come to believe that they are less worthy because of their characteristic. As one of psychologists explains, it is difficult for any person to endure a life lifetime of both subtle or overt messages that attack their self-worth and emerge from it unsected. It is natural that some part of us would internalize these messages without even realizing it. It is no surprise then uh, that uh, the American Psychological Association, EPA, reports 
that discrimination-related stress is linked to mental health issues, such as anxiety and depression, even in children. In 2015, researchers examined 300 studies from around the world and found a connection between discrimination and poor mental health. Even when the researchers accounted for other stress factors, the link between discrimination and mental health disorder was clear. Today we look forward to hearing testimony on how we can help a victim of discrimination and bias access the mental health assistance they required. We hope to hear about the current services that the city makes available and suggestion on how the city can better assist individuals facing discrimination through a holistic approach. Now I would like to give the opportunity to my esteemed colleague, Council Member Ayula, who, who is uh, the chair, my co-chair for today. Council Member, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, and I am the chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I'd like to thank my colleague, Council uh, Member Dr. Matthew Eugene, Chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee, for chairing this hearing with me this morning. Today, hold on, I'm getting a little bit blind. <laughs> Bear with me, guys. Today's hearing will explore the negative mental health consequences of discrimination and bias incidents. Over the last few years, hate crimes and discriminatory bias incidents have increased by a significant percentage in New York City. Between January and October of this year, there have been 309 hate crimes reported to the New York City Police Department, compared to 297 for the same period in 2017. New York City has some of the most comprehensive anti-discrimination laws in the country, but discrimination is still prevalent. In its annual reporting of discrimination cases, the New York City Commission on Human Rights filed a total of 747 cases for 2017. These cases related to discrimination in employment, discrimination in housing, discrimination in public accommodations, discrimina discriminatory harassment, and bias-based uh, profiling by law enforcement. Just this week, we witnessed a horrific video of a young mother whose baby was torn from her arms by law enforcement while she was attempting to receive her voucher for city-funded daycare from the Human Resource Administration Office. In New York City, where we have incredibly thorough anti-administrative discrimination laws, these incidents still occur all the time. The psychological and mental health effects for such incidents on both the individuals who experience them and on the committees who are affected by them cannot be understated. The links between discrimination and mental health disorders have been well studied and well documented. For example, the New York City Commission of Human Rights recently reported that individuals who have been fired because of race, ethnicity, and religion experience symptoms associated with depression at rates of 51.3% compared to just 16.2% of those who had not. Individuals who experienced psychological, um, physical assault and verbal harassment were also associated with increased risk of depression. Discrimination is a powerful and pervasive force that has, to, that has served impact on, severe impact on persons, a person's sense of them, themselves. I'm sorry, I'll take off these glasses. <coughs> Victims of discrimination, bias, and harassment often internalize and normalize the behavior so that they be, um, believe that they are less worthy because of the char their characteristics. As we continue to see this uh, increase in hate crimes and bias incidents in New York City, and while we have a presidential administration that has contributed to hateful discriminatory rhetoric, it is crucial for us to examine the effects of these horrific acts and to learn how we can prevent them from happening in the future. I look forward to hearing from the administration and from advocates on services uh, the city is offering and learning from the city council uh, what the city council can do to address discrimination and hate crimes in New York City. I want to thank my co uh, committee staff, Council Sarah List, Policy Analyst Christy uh, Dwyer, Finance Analyst Jeanette Morrow, my Chief of Staff Millie Bonilla, and my Legislative uh, Budget Director Bianca Almedina for making this hearing possible. And I would like to recognize um, <coughs> Councilmember uh, Holden and Danny Drum. Thank you. Thank you may, uh, very much, uh, my co-chair. Uh, uh, before we begin, uh, I would like to, oh, that has been done already. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember John and uh, Councilmember Alden. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to call upon, uh, you know, the administration with, but before you start uh, speaking, I would like to, to ask the committee council to administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees today and to answer, answer honestly to council member questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So I'll take the lead. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is uh, Gary Belkin, and uh, I want to uh, say uh, uh, we appreciate being here, Chair uh, Ayala and Eugene, members of the committee, uh, uh, committees on mental health and civil and human rights. So I'm the Executive Deputy Commissioner for Mental Hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm also pleased to be joined uh, to my left by Dr. Aletha Maybank, who is the Deputy Commissioner for the Center for Health Equity at the Health Department. Uh, and on behalf of our Acting Commissioner Barbo, we thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify today and also for your shining a light on this issue of uh, the mental health consequences of discrimination and bias. Uh, for decades, uh, discrimination and bias have eroded uh, the ability of too many New Yorkers to fully value uh, and uh, be treated fairly so that they reach life's full uh, potential. Bias, harassment, discrimination, based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, disability, come in varying degrees of subtleness and violence. But even if they're most subtle, these forces can shame, deny, traumatize people, and by doing so ultimately threaten their health and their mental health. We've begun to learn much more about the consequences of discrimination and their links to health and mental health over the life of an individual. A body of work, for example, now describes something called the weathering hypothesis, the process by which the cumulative burden of discrimination experiences on the body, uh, experiencing adverse childhood events, for example, are internalized, uh, as was said, and can have lasting physical harms uh, that can lead to early disease and even premature death. Groups discriminated against have historically been treated in ways that reflect values on who is deserving or not uh, that limit participation and opportunities in all aspects of society. Beliefs and practices reinforced by discriminatory behaviors rooted in both explicit and implicit bias work to negatively impact our understanding, actions, and decisions. The ongoing experience of this objective reality of not being valued by society's institutions, laws, affects individuals and communities alike and can be expressed in subjective reactions such as diminished self-worth, self-harm, violence against others, depression, impulsive and disrupted emotional coping, and stress. So at the health department, we began researching how explicit and, and implicit bias affects the mental health of New Yorkers, including we have fielded our first survey uh, to understand the impact of discrimination and harassment. This survey asked New Yorkers a series of questions, including how they experience racism on a daily basis, how they were treated with less courtesy or respect than other people, how often they were threatened or harassed. We are still analyzing the results of this data and hope to make them public uh, shortly, but preliminary reviews show that, for example, a measure of something called serious psychological distress was far more likely among ad adults who experienced these forms of racism, discrimination, and harassment. Additional data also supports the hypothesis that discrimination poses significant impacts on mental health outcomes. In New York City, we know that LGBTQ youth, for example, are more likely than their non-LGBTQ -peer, non peers to experiencing bullying, homelessness, placing them at greater risk of depression, twice as likely as their peers, and suicide attempts, more than three times as likely. And adults show similar trends. Nationally, nearly a third of LGBT and half of TGNC adults show increased rates of depression at two or three rate times the rate of the general population. And we must also remember that individuals do not experience only one identity. People at intersections of multiple oppressions who most often experience high rates of health inequities include, for example, LGBTQ people of color, especially persons with TGNC experience, and persons with justice involvement, all report even more compounded and greater incidences of mental health issues. And when these New Yorkers seek mental health care, discrimination and bias can also affect the care that they get or don't get. 
For example, studies have shown blacks are five times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia compared to whites, even though they may have the same symptoms. Similarly, LGBTQ individuals experience implicit bias when accessing mental health care with surveys finding that heterosexual providers have implicit preferences that favor heterosexual people. Mental health services and systems therefore can play an important role in undoing the structural racism and, under, and other discriminations these people experience. I am a psychiatrist, which I often qualify by saying in a good way, uh, but I will readily admit that my profession and much of mental health care has been slow to grapple with a history of racism and gender and gender identity bias and discrimination. <coughs> to begin addressing this history, we must redesign then how mental health care is accessed and delivered and change our institutions from within. This work is happening across the health department coordinated by the Center for Health Equity that Dr. Maybank leads and it is central to the administration's mental health agenda as well. Through Thrive NYC, we are challenging how mental health prevention and treatment can be done, designed, reach communities uh, by finding new pathways for care that are participatory, inclusive, and accessible. One key approach used across many Thrive NYC initiatives is called task sharing, which provides non-specialized community members of all stripes with the skills to be part of the care pathways of mental health treatment and prevention, and thus extend them beyond the traditional treatment settings and into more familiar community settings and ways of thinking. For example, Thrive NYC is partnering with local organizations and community members that are best positioned to understand and implement mental health solutions for their own communities. Through the health department's neighborhood health action centers, sister agencies, community-based organizations, and faith leaders, we are focusing mental health initiatives and activities in communities that have been traditionally disinvested. The First Lady, for example, has been instrumental uh, with the Center for Health Equity in launching Brothers Sisters Thrive and Latinx Thrive, which are volunteer efforts working to promote mental health literacy in black and brown communities and to empower and develop a more diverse and culturally relevant mental health workforce. In schools, Thrive NYC in partnership with the Department of Education has expanded training and coaching support for teachers and staff to help students support healthy socio-emotional development and interpersonal resilience. Part of this work includes training for school safety agents and collaborative problem solving, de-escalation, restorative justice practices to make schools more welcoming and avoid unnecessary punitive practices uh, such as suspensions and, arre and arrests that disproportionately affect students of color. And in partnership with the uh, NYPD, we have trained over 10,000 patrol officers in crisis intervention tra team training. We have also partnered with our public safety colleagues to develop teams that respond to behavioral health emergencies with clinicians as part of a range of efforts to change the relationship between pol policing and our communities. Thrive NYC efforts have also focused on reaching communities experiencing bias based on gender identity and sexual orientation. This summer, for example, the city released the LGBTQ Behavioral Health Roadmap, a report that includes recommendations from healthcare providers, community groups, advocates, and public health experts, and we are now working with our partners to find ways that we can start implementing these recommendations. Finally, it isn't enough to change how mental health services are designed. Institutional change is also needed from within to address the impacts of structural racism and gender-based bias at our own place of work. In 2016, the health department launched Race to Justice. This initiative engages staff in conversations about race, power, and privilege facilitating trainings to improve staff capacity to undo racism and gender bias and to recognize how explicit and implicit bias affects the decisions we make as a city agency. By applying such a racial and social justice lens to all the work that we do, we can better prevent, discriminatory, uh, prevent discriminatory actions or their perpetuation. To date, the health department has trained over 80% of its staff, for example, on gender and LGBTQ equity, health equity, and racial equity implicit bias content. Similar work is happening at several other city agencies, thanks to the work of City Council, who 
passed Local Laws 174 and 175 last year. These laws mandate that the Departments of Health and Social Services and the Administration of Children's Services assess internal procedures as well as programs and services to better understand their impact on racial and gender equity. These laws also ensure that agency employees receive vital training in these areas. We look forward to continuing our work of reform, both internally and in the larger mental health care system, to mitigate the effects and address the causes of discrimination. Doing so has to be considered part of any effort to improve the mental health of New Yorkers, and thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Good morning, uh, Chair Eugene, Chair Ayala, and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I'm pleased to be here today with my colleagues from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Belkin and Dr. Maybank, to talk about this important issue. My name is Dana Sussman. I am Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And thank you to the chairs uh, for convening today's hearing. As you may be aware, and as my previous testimony before the Committee on Civil and Human Rights highlighted, the Commission, um, which the agency that enforces the city's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections for the City of New York, uh, recently surveyed over 3,100 Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh New Yorkers about their experiences with discrimination and harassment. The survey results were published in a report earlier this year. The report found high levels of bias, harassment, discrimination, and physical assaults experienced by the Masa JS communities leading up to and following the 2016 presidential election. The report also revealed that victims of such acts are reporting them at low rates. And as uh, Chair Ayala um, mentioned some of our survey results, I'll repeat a few of them here. Um, the survey included two screening questions about depression associated with the survey taker's experience with discrimination and harassment. The findings of the survey show that half of those who have been fired because of race, ethnicity, or religion selected answers that indicated depression at 51.3% compared to just 16.2% of those who did not. Those who experienced employment discrimination of any kind were more likely to screen positive for probable depression, 33.8% versus 15.1% compared to those who did not. Experiences of verbal harassment were also associated with increased odds of depression with over one quarter of those who had been verbally harassed screening posi po positive for probable depression compared to less than one in six of those who had not been harassed. And similarly with physical assault, 36.7% versus 17%. Discrimination in public spaces or public accommodations and experiences of bias, harassment, and discrimination such as vandalism or property damage targeted at one's race, ethnicity, or religion were also associated with depression. And among those who wore religious clothing, having it forcibly removed was also associated with depression at higher rates, 36.6% versus 21.1% of those who did not experience that um, kind of bias incident. As a result of these findings, the commission has been collaborating with our colleagues at Thrive NYC to share this important information we gathered from the report and to cross-train staff. Commission staff trained Thrive NYC's mental health first aid outreach team this past September and we are currently working with Thrive NYC to plan an event with Muslim, Arab, South a and South Asian leaders to discuss the intersections of discrimination and depression as highlighted in our report. And the commission is working with Thrive NYC to arrange a Thrive training for commission staff. I should also note that the city human rights law acknowledges the harm that discrimination causes and um, our legal system allows for damages associated with emotional distress. It's an imperfect system, but um, it is the civil law enforcement method of providing some um, uh, results or justice for individuals who have faced the emotional harm of discrimination. In the past fiscal year, the commission um, finalized 125 cases involving an award of compensatory damages um, totaling over $3.7 million in compensatory uh, damages awards to complainants um, with an average of $30,000 per case, which is higher than any prior year in, in the Commission's recent history. We thank you for convening this important hearing today, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner uh, Balkin. Uh, I want to thank you for your testimony and thank you for the 
great job that you're doing on behalf of the people of New York. But in terms of, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about psychology, we're talking about uh, the effect of discrimination and hate crime on people. This is a very complex situation. People are suffering from depression, you know, from uh, uh, psychological disorder. This is a very, very complex situation. And even, you know, those in the medical field, we are still trying to understand what's going on, you know, in terms of uh, uh, behavior and suffering of those people and what we should do to help them. And can you, because that requires a very qualified and trained staff. I know you are, you are a doctor in psych psychology, I believe, and you have experience, but can you elaborate a little bit about the staff that are there to provide services to the people who are victim of uh, uh, hate crime or discrimination? Because those people, they are doing, you know, they are going through really, really hard uh, time in terms of, uh, you know, coping with this type of situation. Can you tell us about the staff, the trained staff yes. that are there at the end and they are out to handle the situation? So um, I, I agree with you that uh, mental health professionals who work with people who've suffered through these things that we're talking about today, either hate crimes or, or these more subtle everyday um, uh, assaults, um, that uh, we um, use the term trauma-informed care to, uh, to capture um, the, the awareness um, and um, uh, the approach that recognizes that those things really do affect people in very profound ways in terms of how they can manage stress, how they feel unsafe, how, they, um, uh, how, how those experiences uh, really um, get born in many kinds of behaviors uh, so that is a skill set that we try to spread uh, in our Thrive programs, um, especially those that are particularly um, forward-facing uh, these circumstances. So, for example, um, one of the Thrive initiatives develops uh, um, criminal victims advocates in, in, in the NYPD uh, who are well-versed in these areas and methods. Um, we bring that curriculum into the members of our Mental Health Service Corps who are spread throughout the city as clinicians um, uh, among our NYC Well, the, the available call center to all New Yorkers, uh, uh, regardless of the issue, to either get direct counseling or to be directed to more uh, ongoing care, though all those call takers um, uh, have a trauma-informed background. So that skill set is really needed, and we need to spread more of it, uh, to your point. Um, but I would also say that um, um, a lot of the way to get at the complexity that you describe is to also bring mental health to other places. Um, uh, uh, to and, and Thrive is a lot about these opportunities to bring it into the skill sets of people in job training programs who are seeing a lot of folks whose life history have been traumatic in this way, um, in, in, in daycare centers and um, after youth programs and shelters, et cetera. So we really have to uh, meet the complexity where it's at. As I was saying, if we're going to live the reality of how these issues take their toll across our population, we have to re-engineer mental health so it's reaching across our population. Th <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, when, when we talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the staff, but uh, I think that not on the, the staff of different institutions from the city of New York, different agencies. Them also, they are facing, they are handling ca cases of people who have been victim of hate crime of, uh, and discrimination also. I'm talking about s staff from your institution, but staff from the different city agencies also. You know, they are serving people, those people, among those people, there may be also or uh, some of them who have been victim of hate crime or discrimination. Is there any, the training that you are talking about, or, uh, is the training extended to other staff, you yes. know, serving other institutions in the city of New York? Yeah, so I guess now our broadest touch to do that is through um, 
a very ambitious effort to train a lot of our city employees. We're over 40,000 now in mental health first aid. Um, and um, I have to say a lot of the agencies that um, you imply that would benefit from this, um, uh, DSS, NYPD, Department of Corrections, uh, have really stepped up in terms of training um, a lot of their staff. Um, and uh, so that's one way that we bring those, those skills and awareness. And it's really a, a degree of, of awareness uh, of how to work with other people that what, and what they may be going through that uh, we try to accomplish. We've had interest from building on this. We've had interest from some agencies in uh, even deeper skills. Um, and uh, so we're exploring how we can uh, work with them to, to do that. But our city employees uh, touch New Yorkers every day uh, who uh, are the people that we're talking about, who uh, uh, labor under the, 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 the daily oppressions, both, both violent and subtle, of um, discrimination and racism. And um, we want to equip them to uh, be able to be empathic uh, listeners and, and constructively engage with them in the work of the city. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Also, <coughs> hello. Um, at the New York City Department of Health, um, we have taken on the effort of also training our staff. So all of our staff across the agency um, have now, it's actually a requirement um, that they have trainings on race, power, and privilege. They have trainings on gender equity, which is inclusive of LGBTQ equity, as well as health equity. And so we are really working to make sure that our teams um, are equipped to talk about these issues amongst ourselves so that we're able to talk about these issues and recognize them amongst the people that we are also serving. And, and I would add that, um, you know, the, the health department jumping in that in a, in a, in a big way uh, to really reach uh, most of our workforce um, has uh, gotten the attention and the collaboration with other agencies uh, who are stepping forward to do similarly. So. Um, obviously, uh, local laws 174, 175 propelled more of that, but, but uh, we are in collaborating with, um, um, uh, with DOE, with DHS, with ACS. Thank you very much. We have been joined by Councilmember Ben Carlos. And before I turn it over to my co-chair, I got on a, on my last question when I get back also. So when we are talking about uh, psychological uh, 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 behavior or mental issues, that doesn't affect, you know, those uh, 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 issues don't affect only the person per se. But there's an impact on the family also, on the people uh, you know, who are related to that person, family members, children, wife, you, you know, husband, and the entire family. What do you have in place to help the family members, the people who are living with that person who have been victim of crime or bias, to understand the situation, to be supportive, and also in order for them to be able to handle the situation and assist the victim? Do you have any type of uh, support services and uh, outreach and assistance to the family members? Um, so you, br you bring home a, a, a very important point that um, when we learn of bias incidents, we know that it doesn't simply affect, uh, while it deeply affects the individual who has been targeted, of course, it also affects the community around them. So their family, their extended community, um, the, the entire neighborhood. Um, so that when the commission learns of a bias incident, um, we have a few different tools at our disposal. Um, many times um, a, a civil law enforcement action um, brought by the commission or by the victim might not be the right approach. Um, so we generally will seek to reach out directly to the victim or to uh, a local house of worship, um, a community board, and other community um, uh, based organizations um, to see what the right response might be. Um, we also have a community outreach team and often our bias response involves um, our community outreach team as opposed to our law enforcement bureau where we will um, again connect with the victim or the victim's family, um, identify um, if they 
would like to speak with us, know what their rights are, know what their options are, and serve as a liaison to other services, whether it be um, through NYC Well or other city agencies, um, and connecting them to what they to additional services and resources. Um, it might result in a, in a visibility day where we're out in that community, um, partnering with local community-based organizations or houses of worship, um, or a local, for example, NYPD outreach team um, to share information about what people's rights are to be protected against discrimination and harassment. Um, it might be that we hold an event um, or a, a town hall. We might partner with the local council member. Um, so we have a, some different responses. Um, from the commission's perspective, we are not you know, mental health professionals or health professionals, but we do think that it is important that the commission and the city show that we are there to support these communities, that we are regularly there, that we're not there one day and gone the next, but that we are deeply connecting with communities that are feeling vulnerable and under attack um, in this current climate. Um, and we can do that again through the community outreach side of our office, but also through filing um, complaints of discrimination so that we are using the, the law, again, as a tool um, to send a message that these kinds of acts are not acceptable. Thank you very much. Now I want to turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember Ala. So who, who would the commission, I'm trying to better understand the, the relationship between the, the Human Rights Commission and um, Thrive NYC. So <coughs> at what point um, is something triggered, right? That And who, who's responsible for then referring um, to the Thrive group <coughs> that maybe a, a workshop or a community meeting happen? Who does that? Well, it might happen a few ways. Um, so if someone is calling the commission because they face discrimination, whether it's in employment housing or public space or on the street, for example, um, we the first point of contact is usually through a call back from our info line. And um, our info line staff are trained to identify a whole host of issues that um, where we can refer people directly. So if it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of um, conversation, we can refer people to, for example, um, NYC Well, or we can refer people to um, uh, Action NYC if it's related to immigration concerns. A lot there are a lot of issues that might come up on that call. It could be a housing issue um, that is outside of our of our um, of our jurisdiction. Um, so we can do a referral that way. Um, if we're learning through community um, conversations or outreach that a certain community needs more resources or needs more information, we will reach out directly to the Thrive NYC outreach team and perhaps um, build an, an event together. Um, we do that. We do those kinds of interagency events um, regularly based on community need, and so we can create um, a resource event or a town hall. We can reach out to the local council member to join in that effort. We've done a few lately um, as these bias incidents have been kind of this very common um, and incredibly unfortunate um, occurrence, we've been doing more and more bystander trainings. Communities have been asking for um, resources. How do I intervene if I see something happening as a community? Um, so we've connected with um, different um, community-based organizations that ha are regularly engaging in bystander intervention training, and, um, and we're there to provide some of the Know Your Rights information, um, and we're working with community-based organizations throughout the city to host those, identify space where we can do that, bring people together. Um, we recently uh, held one at the Brooklyn Children's Museum with Repair the World and um, uh, the Arab American Association of New York. So we brought together a Jewish organization, um, Arab American, Muslim, South Asian organization, mm -hmm. and held it at the Brooklyn Children's Museum, for example. So we can pu pull together events like that based on what we're hearing from the community, if that might be something that they're interested in, or it could be a more mental health focused event and bringing in, bringing in Thrive. Do you, do you do any of this? Um, do you, does, well, does anybody track the number of complaints that are coming from the public school system in, re in regards to uh, bullying and harassment of this type? Yeah, I don't have that information here, but we do have, we can, we are tracking um, the re what we call the respondents, the sort of defendants in our cases, who's the entity that's been identified as the as the um, alleged uh, bad actor. Um, and so that could be um, another city agency, it could be um, public school, private school, um, private employer, um, so we do have that information or could pull that information. And who will make that Who will make that referral to you? Does the school automatically make the referral to you or does the police department do that? 
<laughs> it really depends. We work um, in partnership with a lot of our city agencies to know when they should be referring cases to us. Um, if someone has an issue at a public school, for example, because a child is being uh, bullied and um, the school isn't intervening in a way that we think is appropriate or in a way that, that the parent or the child um, doesn't think is appropriate or, or responsive enough, um, they certainly can come to us. Um, we've worked with parent coordinators to, par to share information about um, about the resources of the, com of the commission. We, we engage directly with schools and students on programming around uh, their rights. Um, we've partnered with gender and sexuality alliances in different schools to provide Know Your Rights information to those students. Um, and we're expanding our, our reach with respect to, um, to students um, through our community outreach team so that they kind of have the information <laughs> and then they can reach out to us directly. If you have any data that you could share, that would be really helpful. Um, and the reason I'm asking is because I'm in my district alone, I mean, I've, I've had a series of uh, suicides um, in young people who have either been bullied or harassed in the school system and then have uh, gone home and, and committed suicide. And I, you know, it, it, there often seems to be, you know, a disconnect in between services and when, when they did or did not arrive and how timely they were. Um, I just this summer had Coincidentally, I was at a, I was getting a, an award at, at an organization that uh, provides mental health services to young people, and I leave. And I, as soon as I walk out of the building, I get a call from the police department. That an 11 year old in my district jumped off the 16th story roof of her building, um, and it it result it came you know because of, a, of an issue that happened in school. But there was like a pact amongst the children in that school uh, to commit suicide, and there was a lot of bullying online, social you know media stuff. And I don't, I just, it, it felt like, you know, we had to kind of, well, NYC did a really great job. They were in the school immediately. Um, you know, we have really great community partners, but then it kind of, it, it, it's, it stopped at the school, right? Um, there were no services rendered to the development, to, to the witnesses that were, you know, uh, there when it occurred. Um, so we, we were able to, to connect through Thrive NYC, we were able to get the, the resources out to them, but it wasn't something that happened organically, and I think that that's where I, I would like it to come to a place where somebody is automatically, you know, calling and saying, hey, this is a human you know, rights commission issue, this is a, a Thrive NYC issue, like, who is making those connections? Because we're under-resourced as it is in our in, in city agencies, like, how are we getting those, those messages across? I w sorry, I will, I will let de um, the Department of Health um, speak more specifically to the connecting to, s to core <coughs> services here. Um, but I, I would just mention that if you are hearing about um, issues at any schools in your district around, um, you know, schools um, that are not, it from, from what you're hearing, not responding to um, incidents of bullying, of targeting of students because of di different protected categories under the city human rights law, mm -hmm. we can work with you, we can work with DOE, we can, um, so we, we would welcome any um, conversations directly. We, we do get referrals from council members um, for all sorts of kinds of violations of the city human rights law and we'd be um, you know, open to, to speaking with you about those as they come up. And so, I, you know, I would agree from um, overseeing the East Harlem Neighborhood Health Action Center. Um, when that particular incident happened, you know, we were very much mobilized um, and engaged as an agency, working with other city agencies, um, NYCHA. Um, I know my team was speaking with you, your team as well, um, to figure out how best to respond. And, you know, what we are learning is that we're now at this time where we do have this opportunity to pull resources, to pull teams in together and to plan in a way that we haven't before. Um, and so we're really working on that um, very intentionally over the last couple of months and over the next two months to figure out what is that response when something happens, but also what is the prevention as well? How do we support schools? How do we support um, principals? How do we support the residents of, of NYCHA, the community boards, um, but making sure that we have a response of which is actually created along with the community. So Dr. Menendo has been meeting with several of the coalitions within East Harlem, specifically around mental health and mental health response. So we're now moving towards this neighborhood approach um, to thrive instead of not only just kind of the mental health um, service core mm -hmm. pieces or the mental health first aid piece, but how does this all come together um, for a neighborhood response? Yeah. I, I would appreciate learning more about that as well because sure. I think that as elected officials sometimes there are a gazillion community mm -hmm. partners that are great, and yeah. th but they work independent of each other. And sometimes, even when they work collaboratively, they're not necessarily working with the elected officials. And we, what we see is sometimes a little bit different from what they see. And I think that if we work together 
that you know it'd be more impactful we would truly appreciate yeah. that um, you know we have worked with many partners not here but also in other yeah. parts of the world um, who also are thinking through um, and one specifically in London thinking through how do we really respond for black and brown communities yeah. specifically mm -hmm. but also how do we connect better with elected officials to think about this planning as well so we are definitely open to that thank you did you want to add something Dr. Baca? no I was just gonna add uh, you know I, I think um, we're increasingly appreciating the fact that the richness of what Thrive has put out there, its real potential will be met when we find, when we address, when we use those things in these very <coughs> focused, place-based, collaborative, neighborhood-driven, vulnerable community-driven ways um, that we really connect the dots, including where we're in the schools, with where we're in the communities, et cetera, um, so that we knit a fabric of, um, of action that is more effective. No, I, I actually went back the day after and asked uh, people, had, you know, have you seen someone from Thrive? Do you know what Thrive is? And they were really excited that someone had bothered to come and knock on doors and, you know, talk to residents that were sitting in front of the building. And just, you know, there, there was a, they, 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 they were really excited to have you guys there. Um, this is really a question for uh, commi Deputy Commissioner Sussman. So in, in the, you, you referenced that in the report, the MS, uh, the Massa JS uh, report also revealed that victims um, are reporting at really low rates. Do you know why that's so? Is it because they're afraid to do so? Or is it for lack of information on where to file a complaint? I think there's a, a few reasons. Um, and unfortunately, because this survey was quite extensive, we, we had to be very specific about which questions we asked. So we didn't get specific information about, about why people chose not to report. But from our community conversations, um, I think there is a sense that it's not worth people's time, nothing's, gonna, nothing's going to change, um, that some of the incidents that we're talking about are, are uh, unfortunately regular occurrences in people's lives and so to sort of point it out day after day is just not mm. tenable for people um, and when we're talking about some of the larger instances where it might be um, you know loss of a job or um, you know denial of, of, a, of an accommodation in a workplace to observe one's religion um, I think there is um, there is lack of information about what people's rights are and so we really do feel um, it is imperative for us to be um, to be in communities talking about what people's rights are. One of the key takeaways for us was on the piece about religion and religious discrimination in the workplace, that people have very strong protections under the city human rights law to practice their religion in the workplace, to seek accommodations um, so that they can pray in the workplace or take time off for religious observances or wear religious attire in the workplace. Um, and so that was a core takeaway for us that we need to be more um, present, visible, um, communicating our message about the protections under the city human rights law, and even you know be aggressive in our enforcement in these areas so that people know that if they come to us, they can get results. But the truth of the matter is, um, you know, for us, we are, uh, uh, it is an administrative legal process. It, is, it can be a, a long process and an involved process, and people are busy and they have you know, challenges in all, sort, in all areas of, of their lives, and the reality is people will not always seek to come forward because it is, you know, retelling a story they might not want to tell, mm -hmm. and it is time spent that they might not have um, to engage with us. So um, we are sort of uh, taking all of this information and taking stock of how we can be, um, you know, more visible, more uh, make our process more transparent, demystify the process a little bit, um, and and also share that you know people don't have to go through a full complaint process. Sharing the information with us is important too, because again, we ca it can it can direct our work in other ways. What are the different ways to file a complaint? How do you do that? Sure. So um, <laughs> the what sort of at the what you can reach us a few different ways. So our website is nyc.gov/humanrights, and there is a, a space on the homepage where you can submit information either anonymously or identifying yourself for a follow up. Um, where you're sharing information about discrimination. From there, someone will give you a call back um, and we will do a five to 15 minute sort of screening on the phone to identify if this is a violation of the human, potentially a violation of the human rights law, or it might be something else like um, concerns about immigration status or a, a, you know, a, a heating issue, for example, that might need to go to a different agency. Um, 
the other, we, uh, we also screen to ensure that we have jurisdiction. So it has to, the incident has to have occurred in New York City for the most part, um, and for most cases within the past year. Um, from there, uh, an individual will come in and meet with an attorney. They have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of our attorney investigators. <coughs> if someone can't come to the office, we will accommodate them. Um, we can meet them in a, in, in a different space, or we can do the longer intake over the phone. And then from there, our attorneys will draft a complaint, and it'll be filed. So you don't need an attorney to come meet with us. You don't need to have a certain income or below a certain income threshold to um, you know, avail yourself of the commission mm -hmm. services. Um, if you do have an attorney um, or an advocate, they can write a complaint on your behalf and file it. So you can sort of skip that process. But our, we're set up in a way that allows for um, folks without an attorney, without representation, um, to just come forward, share their story, and then the commission staff will take that and move it into sort of a legal complaint that is then served on the um, other party. Okay. I have a whole bunch of other questions, but I'm going to let my colleagues uh, chime in for a little while. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Councilmember Alden, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairs uh, Eugene and Ayala, for this uh, bringing this important topic to, uh, to a hearing. Um, this is very near and dear to me, this topic, and let me tell you why. Um, in 1968, I met my future wife, a Japanese-American. And you can imagine, uh, growing up in an all-white community uh, in Queens, um, being the only Asian-American, or one of only two in the whole neighborhood, my wife suffered tremendous discrimination. I mean, so much so that I, I, she kept it to herself. Uh, for decades. I'm, I'm married 45 years now. And um, a few years ago, uh, a reporter called me and said, we want to talk about, uh, I was a civic leader in the neighborhood, and a reporter called me from a local paper and said, we want to do a story on discrimination you know, in the neighborhoods, and um, w w what, what's your opinion? And I said, I, I told a story about my wife, uh, meeting my wife, and having to put up with so, so many things. But I said, but you need to talk to my wife. Um, but I don't think she'll talk to you, I said. She doesn't really talk about this so much. Um, and he, he uh, finally called my wife. After three attempts, my, my wife said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll talk. But please don't use my name at first. And then, then finally, she's, I said, you have, to, you have to give your name, because the reporter won't, won't probably publish it then. So she spoke uh, to the reporter, a lengthy uh, conversation. Um, and, the, and, the, and the story came out like a week later. I found out things in that article that I didn't know, that my wife never talked about. She says, in the article, she, has, she says, I still can't walk. And my wife's 65 years old. I know she's, uh, she's probably not going to like that. Um, but I met her when she was 15. So, um, But she said, I still can't walk past groups of uh, teens. She said, not a day didn't go by in, in a neighborhood that she didn't feel discriminated, or if somebody said something, uh, anti-Asian remark. Um, she said when she was a cashier as a teenager, if she gave the wrong change, somebody said, go back to your country. Um, you don't belong here. Um, even my own family um, questioned why, why, and we got married in 73, but she, my family was kind of like, you, w my father, who, was, who saw horrific fighting in the Philippines against the Japanese, said, I fought them in the war. How could you marry one? Um, so my family, t you know, some of my, my father wouldn't go to the wedding um, when I married her. It, this is so, and my wife is a great case study because um, she feels, she always felt she didn't have any self-worth. She felt she wasn't, she, you know, she didn't belong. She even said to her sister, please don't tell anybody we're Japanese, you know, as a school kid. She said, because, it, but it affects different people different ways. Her sister, two years younger, it never affected her. She f would fight back. Um, but I've heard, I heard it. I didn't hear it as, as, it wasn't as blatant, but it was subtle. Like I, when we were looking for an apartment, I had to go to the landlord. I couldn't send my wife. Uh, I had to, you know, and then, you know, because they wouldn't rent the apartment to us. We knew that. We saw that. We felt it. Um, but this is, this is so near and dear to me that um, she, and my wife needs you know, to talk to people about this. I, I could see it. Um, and I would, I'm still learning things. Uh, how uh, she, but, but to say that not a day, she goes, not a day didn't go by that she didn't get some description. Somebody would say something in the neighborhood. Because, again, the neighborhood wasn't diverse. 
and she was she obviously felt very different. So that it does affect people over lifetimes. It, she never had the confidence. Uh, I had to urge her all the time. You, you're good. For, you can do this job. You can. Do, and she moved up in, in life, but it it was constantly telling her she's important. She's good. She's she's talented. She didn't believe in that. She didn't. She felt she was inferior. So. This, this is such a great topic. I, I want to thank the chairs, and I, I thank Dr. Bell. I'd like you to talk to my wife, actually, <laughs> because you, you could learn a lot from what she experienced in life. Um, and such a, such a beautiful woman, such a great woman, uh, humble. Um, but, and, and you met her, Diana. Diana so it's, you know, she, she has a lot of talents. I could tell you about her. But it was a constant, constant thing in the neighborhood um, so this is a good argument for diversity. Uh, my wife is, is uh, but just how, so important that that we bring this out because so many millions of New Yorkers probably experience this and they don't talk about it. Um, my kids, you know, I would I would lash out if I heard somebody would say something when I was walking with her and we were dating. Um, I would obviously want to fight, and I did get into fights with somebody that said something to her, and I'd strike back, or somebody be passing in the car and say something. You know, a, ra a racial slur, uh, and I would get that license plate. You know, I would try to. I couldn't, but because it, it was very quick, it's more subtle now. It was blatant then, uh, in the, growing up in the '60s and '70s in, in Queens, but um, it's subtle now. But it's it's still there. We see it. We see it every day. So I thank you for your work, Doctor, and I and I hope this becomes a, a big topic, and I, and I and I urge everyone. To, to talk, you know, especially if you experience it, to bring it out and, and to let's, let's uh, try to eliminate it. I don't know if we're ever going to eliminate it, but we certainly, it's a much better world now than it was then, I want to say. Um, but um, not experience, not seeing it from even my wife's point of view for so many years, not knowing, um, I felt the shame that I, d I had learned a lot in the article. You know, I had to read about, because my wife didn't want to talk to me about it. You know, but it, it, it's it's the same thing when you um, when we experience things, we take we internalize everything, and we don't bring it out. So um, uh, I, I just think this is such a great topic. It's probably <coughs> the best topic that I've I've seen so far in the city council. Where uh, um, I, much more important than the Amazon hearing for me, at least. <laughs> um, uh, but this is this is a. Uh, uh, near and dear to me because uh, it was throughout the family, it was throughout the neighborhood, it was, uh, and even my kids, I mean, experienced some of this. Um, but uh, enough about me. Uh, I just want to, I want to ask a, a question about um, how do you bring it out of individuals? I mean, how do you, um, I mean, it must be tough for many people to talk about it, um, but how do you bring it out uh, that, it, that they'll feel that it'll be solved, like I said before? Um, how much time you got? Uh, I mean, there are so many ways to approach that, uh, uh, helping people get there. Um, uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the best strategy or one of the better strategies, and, and Dr. Maybag was talking about our effort as a department to really empower people to find the, the ways that they uh, want to um, come together, um, uh, own these issues. Um, and uh, really increasingly see our role as uh, empowering and equipping them uh, to do so. Um, I think one big effect of Thrive has been just to open a lid of permission uh, to uh, across city agencies, across elected officials. Across I've never seen this kind of, uh, <coughs> of, of increased um, uh, sense of uh, jumping into this issue um, at all those levels, and we need to um, – uh, help and respect uh, our community the way communities uh, want to do want to do that themselves um, so that's a general answer to your question but uh. thank you very much uh, council member uh, Alden thank you very much for sharing with us this uh, very important and uh, situation that your wife went through and uh, this is a uh, you know, a tangible, you know, uh, statement and that uh, there are so many people in New York City, so many talented people and skilled people in New York City who are contributing to the fabric of New York City. 
and people that uh, deserve to be uh, uh, respected and also regardless of their race, religion, or faith. But unfortunately, this is a tragic uh, reality that they go through every single day, every single day. And, uh, uh, you know, people, some people in the community, especially I want to talk about the immigrant community, specifically Haitian community. Many uh, of uh, members of the Haitian community also who are now doctors, attorneys, they are adults, they are professionals. They have shared with me also the, uh, what they went through when they went to school in New York City. They used to go to, they used to uh, be object uh, of discrimination. You know, they were facing so many difficult time at that time, some of the time, they didn't want, want to go to school. They have to stay home because they are going to be, beat them. They say they will never forget that. This is a trauma that people will never forget. This is uh, the reason why, why w when I was talking about the complexity of the uh, psychological uh, trauma in people. But le let me go back to the children. Those members of the Haitian community, they, are sharing, they were sharing with me tragedy or uh, very difficult moment of their life when they were kids. And some of them said that they didn't want to go to school just because of that. But their parents were forcing them because we are in the Haitian community and many parents, they want their children to go to school. But the children couldn't go to school because of the tough situation they were going to face. So, and that situation had a very negative impact in the uh, education, uh, you know, uh, academic result of those children. So my question to the commissioner and to the doctor, what do we have in place right now? Because there are children who are still facing those situations. When they see the mothers, the fathers of people in their community are being victim, victimized, you know, because of uh, hate crime or discrimination, that affect them too. What do we have in place now to assist their children, to protect them, to give them back the self-esteem, the self-confidence they don't have because of that situation? What do we have in place if we don't have nothing in place? What do you believe we can do all together, the elected official, the health department, the, the commissioner of your civil rights, human rights, what can we create and build together to protect those children because they are going to tra be traumatized for life. Mm. <coughs> I'll start. Um, uh, I mean, this is a, another big topic, but I think it shows the importance of this topic because it, it really is uh, capturing a lot of things that we do as a city and building community and inclusion and um, uh, and how we r reach people early in life uh, to build resiliency and, and, and affirm them as people. Um, uh, from from the, the work that I do around how we're fashioning mental health, um, that translates, as I was saying before, into strategies that really position us in lots of other places. So we have, without getting into great detail, across the, the, uh, the initiatives we're doing uh, through Thrive and other things we're doing as a health department, is to really um, um, skill, support um, uh, places where such vulnerable children are and can be reached uh, in schools and in daycare settings um, and other uh, child, early child facing organizations um, to support parents with skills to um, uh, help them feel like they're empowered to uh, uh, promote the, the socio-emotional growth of their children um, particularly who are facing adverse uh, events. Uh, so we, ha we were doing a lot of that, but, um, uh, and seeing degrees of collaboration across agencies, the way that we're now working with ACS, the way we're now working with the Department of Education, um, to bridge things that have been siloed, like, um, for example, with DOE, school climate efforts and restorative justice efforts and bullying efforts, are in many ways mental health approaches. So how do we link them up with the mental health resources that we now also have in the schools and really create um, these more comprehensive uh, approaches? 
Um, you're right on the money. Early in life is really a critical point. Um, it's estimated that uh, exposure to adverse events, which, a, which include ex experiencing uh, the oppression and discrimination one's parents feels, um, sets kids up for life in terms of poor health and mental health outcomes. Uh, so we've invested a lot through fr Thrive in acting early, but that means reaching early, and it means also collaborating with these other child-serving agencies. I don't know if there are other particular approaches you guys take when sure. you see families. Yeah, so from our perspective as the, you know, the enforcement agency up for the an of the anti-discrimination protections in the city, we are in schools with curriculum um, that talks about people's rights, people's, um, the intersectionality, issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, we have a, a peer mediation program that we bring to schools. It's an intensive eight-week program that our agency leads in coordination with the school school leadership and um, you know the guidance counselors at the school to um, teach young people about restorative justice, about um, de-escalating conflict within their school community. Um, so we are in schools, um, both educating parents, teachers, children about what their rights are in the city and sort of the principles, um, the, f the sort of foundational principles ab about the human rights law, what it means, um, what, what human rights and civil rights mean, um, some of the history of the city. Um, but we, you know, we, we are always endeavoring to build it out, to expand it, um, to bring it to more schools. Um, we really work on sort of a school level in each in different neighborhoods um, to get, you know, when schools reach out to up, us or we reach out to schools to get that curriculum um, and into schools and, and work um, with the school administration to, to bring that. Um, so that's sort of our approach from a community outreach education standpoint. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I want to do something that I forgot to do before because I would be uh, remiss if I didn't take the time to do it. But I, I will do it in a few minutes. <laughs> I will do it, be doing it in, in a few minutes. But uh, let me, in terms of uh, uh, inquiries, you in, know, uh, Commissioner Sussman, in the Commission of, of Human Rights, do you track the inquiry, inquiries requested by people for mental health services? I'm not sure if we if we track referrals where we refer people, but I can look into that and get back to you on. But that. about inquiries when people go over there. Right. So it would translate for us into a referral. So if someone is calling us for mental health services, we would refer that to um, the appropriate referral source, which would typically be NYC Well. Um, and so I would I have just have to check to see how we're categorizing those kinds of calls and get back to you on that. But do you have a log? Do you have a record? to find out how many people come, you know, to the Commission of Human Rights to uh, to complain about the discrimination and about or also about the the the, 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 the mental uh, uh, status due to those uh, discrimination or bias uh, action. Are you just to, so I understand the question? Are you asking about discrimination based in me the mental health service provision, or about the impact, mental health impact of the discrimination? Impact, yeah, mental health impact. Got it. Um, so again, I will have to check to see. We have a tracking database where mm -hmm. where our um, our info line staff are entering a lot of fields with information, and I can check to see um, if we have numbers on um, how many people either that have. Um, identified mental health concerns um, through the call and or the numbers of people we've referred to NYC well. So I know that uh, the Human Rights Commission doesn't provide, you know, service, mental health services, of course, but you, you make referral. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about uh, the referral, the, the, the organization where you refer people to? Different, the different organizations that we refer people to? Mm -hmm. um, sure, so um, we have ex an extensive uh, referral binder, um, so it really will depend on the issues that are raised. Um, you know, we have had, our staff are trained um, by other city agencies to identify issues that might come up um, either related to or uh, you sort of um, 
collateral to the discrimination case. Um, that might be, again, concerns about immigration status, which would go to Action NYC. Um, if, we, if people um, are looking for legal representation, even though, as I mentioned before, you don't need a lawyer to come to the commission, people may be interested in connecting with a lawyer. We work with um, every sort of uh, free uh, nonprofit legal service provider in the city. So we have extensive referrals. If it's a housing court issue, if it's um, an, a workplace dispute, um, a wage and hour issue, for example, um, we don't handle wage and hour cases, so we can refer them to um, uh, free legal services that, that would help them navigate that. We can also make referrals to other city agencies, of course, um, or state agencies, for example, if a discrimination case happened in, uh, you know, in Westchester and not in New York City, we can refer them to an agency that can handle that case because we don't handle cases outside of the five boroughs. Um, so we really have a, a, a pretty extensive referral list and, um, and options for people at when they call us that we can identify and send people um, to, the right, to the right resource. I'm glad that you mentioned free referrals, free services, because that was going to be my next question. Yes. But my question is... Uh, do you follow up and to find out if those people that you refer to different organizations, if the case has been handled properly, if they have been served properly, what has been done for them, or if they were in need of additional assistance? Sure. Um, I can find out what the protocol is. Typically, though, um, if an individual um, is connected to, we, I do hear of these kinds of um, cases where someone might have been referred to to someone and didn't get the services they need. They will, will often have the information of the uh, staff member they spoke to at the commission. will call back. We will work with them again to find the right resource for them. I'm not sure if we are affirmatively uh, following up on a regular basis to ensure that they've gotten the services they need, but I can check on that. Just for the purpose of uh, evaluation, to know exactly how good we are doing and on in certain situations, I think, you know, the commission should keep the record. Mm -hmm. How many people they refer to organization, different organization for what reason, right. and how you are handling the situation. Because we have to, to make sure we provide the services and we have to ensure that we do it properly too. And that will help us, you know, better handle the, 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 the situation in the future. We gotta know what is needed, how many people get affected, how many people come to complain about the mental status, how many people are seeking uh, mental health services. So we got to know those, uh, those numbers. Sure. One other thing I will mention too is that we have um, personal and professional relationships with people in a nearly all, if not all, of the referral agencies that we're sending people to. So we have, you know, uh, and, and people had formerly, you know, people on our staff have formerly worked at organizations like Legal Aid or Legal Services NYC or Make the Road, um, organizations that we are regularly in communication with about a host of issues. So we have these direct communication lines to the referral organizations that we're sending people to. We are not typically sending people off into uh, an entity that we are not um, regularly engaging with and familiar with and know the staff there. So if any issue does arise, we're aware of it and, and are having you know, regular communications with those organizations. And what type of training that uh, the staff from the Human Rights Commission receive in order for them to be able to identify mental health issue of sure. those client of people who go to them? Sure, so, so um, some of our staff um, that represent sort of the most public-facing um, departments of, our, of, of the agency, um, our community outreach team and our law enforcement bureau have received the mental health first aid training. Um, we also are cross, uh, mayor, the mayor's office for people with disabilities also regularly trains all of our staff on working with people with disabilities and that covers the full spectrum of disabilities. Um, we also are regularly trained by the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, um, which allows us to use tools around trauma-informed questioning um, and working with people who may have been victims of trauma, whether it's gender-based or not. Um, and we are uh, working with Thrive to ensure that our staff are trained um, uh, with them to um, to properly identify cases that would make would be a, the appropriate referral to NYC well. So um, the staff from the Human Rights Commission, did they raise any concern or any issue in terms of themselves facing some stress, dealing with people, 
coming to them with mental issues or, or, or seeking health uh, assistance, mental health assistance, did they raise also certain concern about themselves, you know, yes. the need of having also some assistance in that uh, direction? So uh, this is an uh, incredibly vital question and something that we are working hard to address right now. Um, the, you know, the, the current climate um, nationally has, I think, traumatized and re-traumatized a lot of people, including um, members of our staff and probably members of every uh, city agency. Um, uh, you know, the, there is in sort of an unrelenting um, a news cycle of attacks on different communities. Um, we're hearing of, 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 of horrific, um, Violence and attacks and discrimination on nearly a daily basis, and so we are very conscious that you know what our our staff do is address these issues on a daily basis, and we want to ensure that our staff feel they have resources internally, both through um, their colleagues, their supervisors, that we provide support um, to our staff, and that we also engage in self care and allow people to take time to um, to address the needs that. Uh, their own mental health needs and emotional health. Um, and so we are working currently to embed some of that, um, bring in some, um, some experts and some resources for our own staff to ensure that they you know, are taking care of themselves as they kind of deal yeah. with um, the trauma of, 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 the, of the communities they are serving. Thank you, I appreciate that because uh, the staff, they are not angel, <laughs> they're not superhero also. I think uh, but if they are f b uh, f well fit mentally and physically, they will be in a better position to help the other people. Thank you so very much. Let me uh, turn it, I'm sorry. So, so I'd, I'd also <laughs> add um, that at the health department um, and at our neighborhood health action centers, our, our teams are in the neighborhoods experiencing, oftentimes now that we've hired many um, folks that are from NYCHA, thankfully, or from the neighborhoods, not only are they working, but they are living in the, in the neighborhoods of, that are experiencing constant levels of violence and aggressions and all of those kind of things that affect and impact mental health. And so we have definitely <coughs> been challenged in a very different way as a health department to think about how do we really fully support our teams? How do we acknowledge one and validate um, that they are experiencing um, trauma every single day and that it impacts their work, but it also impacts them as they go back home um, into their neighborhoods. And so at the Action Center specifically, we've been hosting many more what we call healing circles, a very traditional um, way of pulling people together. Um, well, not traditional in the medical system sense, but traditional in many of our cultural um, senses um, of pulling people together um, along with community residents and staff to talk about um, what are they going through, what are they experience, how do we not only understand what's happening, but how do we heal together um, and figure out pathways to do that more often. And so we've been hosting a lot of that and there has been lots of um, asks from schools um, and many of our partners at the neighborhood uh, level as well. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn it uh, now uh, to my uh, co-chair, Council Member Ayala. A couple, maybe let me see, two years ago, actually, actually after the president was elected, <coughs> we had a, an incident in, in the district where we had a family. It was a family of three siblings that lived in the same building. They had lived in the building for many, many years. Um, and the owner, who was elderly, passed away and left the building with an inheritance to a uh, daughter and um, uh, someone else. It was split. Uh, and the daughter decided that she wanted to sell the property, and so they came up with this scheme to get rid of the existing residents, many of whom happened to be undocumented. Um, and they had these like big burly guys coming and banging on people's doors and telling them that they were ICE and that they needed to leave their apartments like immediately. Um, and it took, <laughs> I mean, this family was in, in, they were so afraid that they actually picked up in the middle of the night and they uh, entered into a lease agreement with a really shady landlord just a few blocks um, from the, the original apartment that had no windows and it was like in the middle of winter. We had, uh, there were newborns in, in, in the apartment because now all three siblings had to, you know, they had three individual apartments now they were all living under one roof. Um, that case was reported to NYPD, right? Because 
it was becoming physical in nature. She's uh, a vendor. They would follow her to her place of employment. They would stand on her corner, they would park their car literally right behind her and just stare at her. They would circle her around. They would follow her children to school. Um, it was very traumatic for me having to deal with that experience. And we were able to work with uh, PD um, and with uh, legal services to help uh, navigate that. And so she was able to regain um, you know, access to her original apartment. And I believe that there was some uh, monetary compensation that was made at that point. But it, it, it makes me question then, if a case like that, right, where a person is being discriminated against goes to PD, does that then discourage that individual from making a complaint with you, or would it be redundant to do so? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I actually know that case quite well. I was oh. regularly in touch with the attorneys. There was a team, I think it was uh, New York Lawyers for the Public yes. Interest and some other attorneys about um, about that case. So I, I'm very familiar with the case. It was horrific, and I'm so there was an excellent team of attorneys working on I that case, and they that. were able to get a really good result I, I, um, from what I'm aware of. Um, so um, that case could come to the commission, and we certainly see there's been an uptick of cases like that um, where people are being um, essentially forced out of their apartments or, f or forced to sign over a, surrender, a lease surrender agreement of some kind um, because of threats of, I'm going to call ICE or I'm going to call the police and you're going to be picked up because they want to turn over the building. Um, and, um, and so we are seeing those cases, and we do um, take those cases and litigate them as discrimination based on immigration status um, or a form of tenant harassment. Um, if someone reports that to the NYPD, they can also come to the commission. It's not redundant. Um, obviously, we have different tools available mm -hmm. at our disposal. Um, if someone is feeling like they are in imminent harm, and I know there were some threats about, you know, like the boiler, mm -hmm. you know, the setting the building on fire in the middle of the night yeah. kind of thing. If you're in Im facing imminent harm, NYPD is, the, is where you need to go, obviously. The commission mm -hmm. is not equipped and does not have the jurisdiction to handle that kind of threat. Do you think that's con creating confusion amongst the immigrant community, right? Is it a hate crime or is it a, is it a, is it a discrimination right. case? Sure. Because like, it's, it's a very fine line. So It is, and they can often confused. overlap. I mean, yeah. I, I do think it's, it's, it's quite challenging, um, and I'm not entirely sure in this moment how we kind of unpack that for, for people um, so that they understand, but I think the the best thing I can say is that you can come to us and we can, you know, provide, we can connect directly to NYPD and to the people that we work with at the NYPD so that we are jointly mm -hmm. addressing the situation. We are able to, you know, get people uh, monetary damages for the harm, the emotional harm that they have experienced. We can potentially get them back in the unit um, or, or get them, you know, get the uh, landlord who's been found to discriminate or harass pay for them to move to a different location. Um, we can get policies changed. We can ensure we can monitor the landlord moving forward. But we can't, you know, arrest someone or charge them with a crime. Um, however, those two processes can, can happen along parallel tracks. So I think it's important that people, when they are facing, um, you know, threats of violence or harm, that they know that the NYPD is a resource, um, but they also know that they have rights um, and they would drive the case with us. They are the, you know, we are investigating, they are the ones bringing us the information, and we can um, get different forms of relief for them. Um, <coughs> but again, I know it's, it's complicated. One is a civil process, mm -hmm. one's a criminal process, um, but they're not mutually exclusive. Um, and so um, it, it, but it's systems that people have to navigate, and, um, and that is why we work with a lot of community-based organizations because they are the ones sort of embedded in communities and talking to community members so that they know they can pick up the phone and call yeah. any one of us um, to sort of figure out what the best approach might be. I might be calling the commission to do a workshop with maybe <coughs> council members, uh, constituent services staff, because I think making that distinction is really important because I, I, I don't know why I get the feeling that more people may be going to their local precinct and not necessarily connecting mm -hmm. um, because there may be some confusion about whether or not it's the one and the same. Right, and we would welcome that opportunity absolutely okay. to I work with you. I have one last question, um, if I can find it. Where did I put it? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Here, I go with the glasses again. I hope some of you can uh, at least feel bad for me because <laughs> <laughs> this will be you one day. <coughs> so we heard about the terrible tragedy at the HRA uh, office, which I referenced in my opening statement, um, where
um, Jasmine uh, Heatley was waiting uh, to receive a voucher for her, uh, a city-funded voucher for her one-year-old son and became tired and decided to sit on the floor because there were no more seats. Uh, HRA employees then called 911 and law enforcement who arrived at the scene eventually brought her to the ground and tore her one-year-old baby from her arms. Uh, this incident was a clear example of what can happen when employees do not have proper training for interacting with clients who may have experienced various forms of discrimination or trauma. So what is the commission doing to ensure that uh, your employees uh, don't react to individuals uh, seeking services in a discriminatory, insensitive, or harmful manner, especially when employees are feeling overworked or frustrated? Um, and I, I think that goes kind of beyond just your, right, your employees, but are you seeing a pattern of this type of behavior? I mean, people are under-resourced, right? And, and when you work with, especially in customer service work, it's, it's, you know, I mean, you're dealing with a gazillion personalities that are coming in and people are coming in with their own experiences of trauma and uh, discrimination and, you know, all of the other things that come with life, right? Um, how are we training these individuals who, who may be burning out as well, right? Because they also come in and are human yes. beings with their own baggage. Um, how, how are we as a city dealing with those issues to ensure that we're not seeing, you know, more cases like that of Ms. Headley? So the commission, uh, it's a, a very important question and, um, and you know, we are all um, very much, um, you know, aware of, of the incident and concerned about it um, deeply. Um, what I can say is that the commission, we have, you know, law enforcement authority over sister agencies as sister agencies are employers, um, are in some circumstances potentially housing providers, as places of public accommodation where people from the public come in and seek services. Um, and we have cases against our sister agencies just like we have cases against private entities throughout the city. Um, but what, I, what I'd like to emphasize here is that we also work in, on an intergovernmental um, way with our sister agencies when we hear about concerns ac across the board about different issues that might come up that might implicate the human rights law or even best practices. Um, and so we have, we've established relationships with, um, with many of the sister agencies to um, provide resources, help um, uh, develop policies that are in line with the principles of the city human rights law. Um, and that had not existed at the commission um, you know, in prior years. Uh, Commissioner Malalas really made it a focus of her work to create relationships with sister agencies. So we are not just an enforcement agency, but that we are there to provide resources, whether it's know your rights um, training or know your responsibilities training or um, helping um, agencies identify policy changes that they'd like to make or um, building out cultural competency training. We have a similar to DOHMH um, training around gender identity um, and um, working with different transgender communities and gender nonconforming communities. Um, and we have trainings on combating um, anti-Muslim racism. Um, we have, you know, we have trainings about working with people with disabilities. We ha so we are um, working to ensure that our staff and that um, as requested staff of other agencies are getting access to this information and, this, and these trainings and also knowing what their obligations are under the city human rights law as employers, places of public accommodation or housing providers. Um, uh, you know, we are um, an agent, we are not uh, of the size of DOHMH or some of the larger agencies, but we are uh, eff effective, we hope, um, in, in carrying that message through so that agencies are thinking about these principles as they train their staff, as they um, implement policy change. Um, so, so again, we have an enforcement side to it, but you also have an intergovernmental side to it as well. Thank you so much. I, <coughs> I agree with uh, Councilmember Holden. This was a, a great hearing. I think uh, we've learned a lot. I wanted to recognize Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, who was uh, here a few minutes ago. Um, and I think that's it for my uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Co-Chair Ayola. Uh, as I said there previously, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to do something to respect the protocol because uh, we are all agree this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, public hearing and this is a very important topic. But it couldn't be possible without a wonderful staff, remarkable staff who are hard to make it happen. I didn't make it happen, they made it happen. Trust me, and we owe them a great uh, deal of gratitude for that. And I want to thank uh, uh, the community staff, uh, Abani Ayuja, Council of the Committee, 
and uh, Leah Squidpeck, also policy analyst, and Nevin Singh, financial analyst. They work so hard to make this happen. Thank you very much to all of you. But uh, before uh, I turn it over back to my co-chair, I, I want to ask uh, uh, some few questions very quick. But we know we we are New York City. We are fortunate, and I can say you know in the United States we are very fortunate to have so many people coming from all over the place to live in the city. They come with the expertise, the skill, the knowledge, and the desire to be part of the fabric of United States, the fabric of New York City. They work hard every single day to make New York City this uh, beautiful city that we love all. But there are certain challenges they didn't expect. They were not prepared for those challenges for many reasons. Some of them, you know, they are immigrants. They come to another structure, another system. And also some of them, they are facing language barrier, cultural barrier. When they are facing challenges, they are afraid to go come forward to seek assistance and also to benefit from all the from the all beautiful and wonderful services, you know, available in the city of New York. So let's say, for example, is the, the, the person is a victim of hate crime or discrimination, because the person is immigrant. Some of the time, the person doesn't want to come to speak. If the person has uh, a language barrier, the person is afraid to come. So what do we have? I'm talking about the uh, Department of Health and also Human Rights Community. What do we have to encourage those, those people, to reach out to them, to let them know, this is, listen, you are entitled to that. You have to come. That not only is going to help you, but that will help us also prevent other cases or other situations like yours. What are you doing, you know, to make sure that those people they come forward, and they inform us, and they seek also assistance that they deserve. Mm. Um, so I think you know it, it brings up the earlier point that the earlier councilman brought up is, uh, and he he mentioned how his wife started didn't feel like she belonged, um, and so this context of othering and belonging um, is very important and critical for cities to understand as they start to do services. And we as cities have to figure out what do we need to do in terms of our staff capacity? How do they need to act? What are the skills that they need to have? What do we need to acknowledge in order for people to feel like they are belong, they belong and not othered? You know, and so the other term they call that, are how do we become an inclusive city? Mm -hmm. And the reality of that is that we all be feel like we belong more so when we feel we trust somebody else or we trust an institution. And so we, as the health department, have definitely made much more efforts um, for, for several years, and especially via our, our neighborhood health action centers, formerly called district public health offices, um, places and spaces that are rooted in neighborhoods and communities um, for a period of time, but a lot of intention around being there to build relationships with people, um, to say that we're present and that we are responsive. Because if we are not, it's really difficult to have people feel safe or to allow people to feel safe to come in um, and to utilize our services or to even share the information um, that they actually have the power to know. I always say I, I usually don't use the term in power because I feel people have the power oftentimes in neighborhoods to see what we can't see as institutions. And so the way to bring that together is to make sure that we are much more intentional around whether it's Thrive NYC in build, being a neighborhood um, we now have new teams that are, uh, and we've made new investments to make sure that we have staff that are talking with our neighborhood partners and residents about mental health, um, but also making sure that those planning efforts are not top down, um, that they are inclusive of the lived experience of those who are experiencing bias um, or um, oppression. And I think that is the critical piece um, that government and we as, as a city um, can do to make sure that we are inclusive. And the other piece that we're doing in terms of LGBTQ, uh, we have launched out for safe spaces. So we are working with our action centers and other um, community facing centers to become LGBTQ friendly spaces. So that we're more of allies with, especially with young people and they feel um, that uh, these, these places that they can come in without being judged. Um, and those are the ways that we start opening the door um, and recognizing um, what and affirming the humanity of people within our neighborhoods. And, uh, Thank you very much. 
And on uh, you know the example you opened with of new immigrants and particularly undocumented New Yorkers, um, we always try to amplify the message that public services are open to the entire public, and we we don't ask and don't discriminate by immigration status for all of our health services. Um, but uh, we are also we've also started talking um, with the mayor's office for immigrant affairs, and I can't say we've figured it out yet, but we've been thinking about ways that some of the resources that Thrive allows, can we, put, can we position them in places that those people do trust and would go to, which are going to be non-traditional? Um, uh, and so, and so we're, we're sort of starting to understand what those possibilities might be. Which are faith based, which yeah. might be churches, which might be barbershops, barbershops which yeah. might be which might be legal assistant o assistance offices. I mean, so we really have to recreate where mental health happens so that it feels credible, safe, and owned by the people we're trying to reach. Thank and you very much. I would just add, um, similar to um, what Dr. Maybank had described, you know, we have worked really hard to build the credibility of the commission by, and the best way that we've, and the quickest way that we've identified doing that is by hiring people who are deeply embedded in communities, who have uh, credibility um, from their prior professional work or from their um, community civic work um, outside of their professional lives. Um, so we speak um, over 30 languages at the commission. We're a staff of about 155, 160. And and of that we speak over 30 <coughs> to 35 languages. Um, we have brought on people who are lead advisors on different communities in the city, whether it be um, Jewish communities, uh, African immigrant communities, Muslim Arab South Asian communities, LGBTQ, trans communities. So we have brought in people with those community connections and the credibility um, from their leadership work um, in, again, religious communities or, um, or a whole host of different um, uh, areas um, that they can then lend that credibility to uh, the work that they do with the commission and are back out in the community just in a different role. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Suzman. Thank you. And thank you also, Dr. Belkin and Dr. Uh, Maybank. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I say thank you for the wonderful job that you're doing on behalf of the New Yorkers and behalf of the people of New York. And uh, as you know, this is a team effort. It, re it would require all of us, doctors, uh, elected officials, community leaders, organization, to work together to provide the services, the assistance that those people need. And I commend you for the wonderful job that you are doing. And this is uh, uh, the situation of immigration, uh, discrimination, harassment, you know, due to ethnic uh, background, religion, and belief. This is something that has been that exists, and, and it will take a lot to erase it. I don't know if we will be able to do, do it, but we have to continue to work together to make sure that we make New York City a better place, place for everybody. Unfortunately, I have to step out. I got to go to another meeting. I'll be back, and I will turn it over to my co-chair, Councilman Barrella. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you later. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Will you tell someone to me? Thank you. All right, so we will now be bringing up the first panel. Lauren um, Cujano, Marissa Franco, and Adrina Miles. Adina Miles, sorry. Good afternoon, guys, whenever you're ready. Uh, 
Oh, thank you. You hear me now? Hi, my name is Adina Miles. I'm also known on Instagram as Flatbush Girl. Um, I'm considered a community activist. Uh, I'm a lone crusader who encounters a lot of pushback from within my own community for speaking up about issues within the Orthodox community. Um, and I'm here to read some testimony regarding discrimination that happens on an internal level within the community. I'm here to talk I'm here today to talk about the internal discrimination and isolation that members of Orthodox Judaism experience by members of their own tribe when they publicly do not conform to their standards. These biases create conditions that are conducive to declined mental health. The lack of formal complaints does not reflect the actual number of these discriminatory instances because many do not speak out due to fear. My mother is a licensed psychologist and is one of the directors of the mental health counseling program at Brooklyn College. From a young age, I've heard her talk about certain buzzwords like therapy, catharsis, growth, culture, identity, self-expression, authenticity, etc. From a young age, I was extremely aware that psychological health was, an, was as important as physical health. Being a member of the Jewish Orthodox community has many advantages. We are a close-knit tribe that looks out for one another. There are hundreds of organizations that are set up to ensure that the community continues to thrive and has all the necessary resources to be helped from within the community, rather than having to seek it outside from a world that does not understand the Jewish mindset and conditions and sensitivities. But in this space of wonderful connection amongst brothers and sisters exists a significant faction that struggles with unaddressed mental health issues due to the constraints of conformity. What some males experience as elation from joining a congregation to engage in prayer, others experience as a feeling of pressure to put aside some aspects of their individuality for the sake of camouflaging within the greater whole. What some girls experience as a feeling of belonging in a classroom of girls who dress and act all within a similar manner, others feel as though their identity is being determined for them before they had a chance to choose an identity for themselves. What some parents experience as feelings of gratitude for having children in a school system that instills the values of Judaism, others feel as though they have to undo some of the messaging that their children come home repeating. What some women experience as pride for being in a community that values modesty to the point that it excludes female representation in printed media, yes, there is no female faces allowed in Jewish printed media, Others feel objectified and sexualized and are uncomfortable with their sons and daughters picking up on those signals. If you find yourself on the former side of these previously stated situations, you will experience the most magnificent and enchanting life full of meaning and belonging. But if you find yourself on the latter side, even in one era, area, you are unquestionably going to experience feelings of isolation, shame, and guilt. The community thrives on conformity and requiring members to fit into a box. There is no space for someone to color outside the lines. Those people who do are often shunned by their teachers, families, and clergy, like myself. There are some supportive spaces, like small rec rooms for kids who might be a little lost, to play pool with their friends, and there might be a school that is more accepting of girls who are experimenting with their sexuality or with recreational drugs, but none of these spaces are considered sanctimonious. It is perceived by the former parts of the community as a place for rejects and misfits who couldn't handle it, who couldn't recognize the beauty, who are sick in the head, who are the products of dysfunctional homes, and very often these individuals leave the community completely and are not rehabilitated to the impossible standard of the community. There are concept is, concepts ingrained from a young age called Chilol Hashem, Mesira, and Lashon Hara. The stated explanations for these philosophies is to not invite anti-Semitism into the community, but it's actually used as a way to gag and control and keep a lid on internal problems. 
This tactic has been used to protect pedophiles and criminals and not enable positive change within the community by keeping abuse of power from becoming public. The Jewish community needs a network of support so that they can file complaints regarding gender and sexual discrimination without the risk of them being ostracized by their own community. Many Orthodox Jews have a personal story to share of how they sacrificed their identity or how their identity was judged to the point of it challenging their mental health, but most will never do so under the fears of rejection and isolation. You will never hear most of these stories because of the internal pressure that is exerted from a very young age. <clears throat> we know it's impossible to quash the human spirit, so the only thing that is accomplished by the discrimination tactics is that people end up leading double lives. They are closed off from the support systems that are needed. I am a lone public crusader who deals with hates and threats just because my heart goes out to those who need someone to make them feel like they're not so crazy and that they're not alone. I run an Instagram account under the name Flappish Girl and I have 45,000 followers, 90% of whom live in New York. Their user activity is completely inactive on Saturdays, indicating that they are Orthodox and Sabbath observant. These are people who love Judaism and its practices, and its practices but are frustrated. The message of frustration within the community resonates with them. Over the last few years, I have received thousands of personal gut-wrenching stories. Many were shared anonymously out of fear of the word getting out in our small, tight-knit community. And I'll read you two right now. I grew up my entire life being forced to dress and act and do things that I didn't connect with. I grew up hearing the Jews around me say horrible things about anyone who didn't fit into their idea of what a Jew should look like. I never felt like I fit in. As I got a big, bit older, I started doing what I wanted, but as I was so sickened and turned off by what I went through as a child that it ruined religion for me and in addition, my mental health. I went through so much trauma growing up in the religious school system and religious neighborhoods. What I went through ruined every part of me. I now suffer from anorexia. I'm pretty sure I'm asexual, although I wasn't always such, and I have automatic negative feelings towards religious Jews that I can't control, even when they haven't done anything wrong to me, all because of the kinds of things you've described that go on in the Jewish kinds of communities. Here's another testimony. Hi, Adina. I really appreciate it that you were speaking out. I would like to bring something to your attention. I live in Muncie, and the Hasidic, in, in the Hasidic world, women are not allowed to drive. I feel I am in prison. My husband, my husband doesn't mind that I drive. It's the schools that don't accept your kids if you drive. I personally am afraid to drive because then my kids won't have a school. The more Lipish won't accept me if I left the system, so I'm stuck. I do take taxis, but what's the limit? I can't go far, I just run away for a few hours. Driving, like we're talking about just driving a car. I'm almost done, by the way. Thank you for your patience. There are thousands of ways in which the Jewish community can experience discrimination and bias from external sources, for example, non-Jewish offenders. But my experience and testimony is mostly focused on ways in which this group can be discriminated against from within. These discriminations are incurred by Jewish establishments with religious standards and rules. Some of these include synagogues, schools, newspapers, and even restaurants. In synagogues, for example, warning letters are sent to female congregation members who are violating the length of their wig, skirts, and other specifications of modesty, that they'll be kicked out of the synagogue if they don't comply. In schools, children are removed from schools in situations when students are engaging in unsupervised conversation with the opposite gender. Students went to a westernized establishment like a movie theater. Students are experimenting with recre recreational drugs off of school grounds. In newspapers, editors will reject any advertisements that feature the face or silhouette of a female, even a young girl. In restaurants, as I have just experienced firsthand this week, and it was on the cover of the Daily News, restaurant owners are threatened by kosher certifiers that they will lose their kosher stamp of approval if they host events that are led by anyone who might be gay, or if they have TVs playing in the restaurant, or if they have radios playing in the restaurant. 
I ask that you please consider ways in which such reporting can be done safely and anonymously for members of the Orthodox community so that the fear tactics instilled in us from a young age can be combated. With your support and resources, those suffering from mental health issues as a result of discrimination from within the community can come forward to ask for help to hold these institutions accountable without the fear of being ostracized forever, kind of like me. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the New York City Council Committee on Civil and Human Rights for holding this hearing. My name is Dr. Marissa Franco. I have my PhD in psychology, and I do my research on the negative effects specifically of racial discrimination on mental health. I just wanted to present a short overview of some studies that have linked discrimination to mental health. A study with over 3,000 racial minorities found that discrimination related to a number of mental health issues, including depression, panic disorder with agoraphobia, agoraphobia with a history of panic disorder, post-traumatic stress and substance abuse. Agoraphobia is the fear of leaving your house. So the fact that discrimination can lead people to have a fear of, contributes to people having a fear of um, leaving their house is quite severe. A meta-analysis is a study that integrates findings across multiple studies. A meta-analysis combining findings from over 18,000 black people found links between discrimination, anxiety, depression, and psychiatric symptoms. Another meta-analysis from 32 studies on racial discrimination found that both subtle and blatant forms of discrimination negatively affect mental health and to similar degrees. So to really understand why discrimination affects mental health, I wanted to highlight a popular theory in um, psychology called minority stress theory, which was developed by Elon Meyer in 2006. And so the theory really indicates that s discrimination and stigma provokes a sort of state of mind in the minds of the stigmatized. And so the theory outlines the state of mind that comes with being discriminated against. One is really just feeling excluded, alienated, lonely. So folks who are discriminated against, you know, they don't feel like they have a cultural home. They might feel culturally homeless. Um, the stress related to discrim discrimination lies not only in the specific incident, but also in the resistance of others believing and vi validating the reality and significance of one's personal experience. So there's the experience of discrimination and stigma that one goes through, and then there's others questioning one's experience of discrimination and stigma that leads one to self-doubt, that leads one to think, you know, am I the one that has an issue here? And um, also contributes to constant rumination regarding the experience that imp impacts mental health over time. So what I think about discrimination also contributes to a sense of hypervigilance, and that's the sense that you are chronically aware that you could be discriminated against in any given context. And so when I think about this, this is really like, you know, after you watch a horror movie, you might fear, like, going home, it's dark, and now you fear that there's like a monster behind every corner, behind the door, whereas you've probably gone home in the dark a bunch of times and you've never felt that way. But after seeing that horror movie, now you're sort of vigilant that there might be monsters and scary things everywhere. And so similarly, discrimination creates the sense of hypervigilance for continued discrimination, chronic vigilance that discrimination can occur again at any time. And so this is why with some of my research, I found that multiracial individuals experiencing more discrimination had fewer white friends, less satisfaction with their friendships, and with their overall community. When minorities are discriminated against, they seek to avoid further interactions with the dominant group because of fear of experiencing further discrimination. And this is particularly an issue because the dominant group has access to all types of resources. I don't know if you folks know, but actually minority members of minority groups are 20% more likely to quit their jobs than member of members of the dominant group, discrimination being one of the contributing factors. Last, individuals undergoing discrimination expend ongoing mental efforts to monitor themselves to not provoke further discrimination. So for example, a Hispanic individual who feels comfortable speaking in Spanish may now not speak Spanish because they know that that may provoke ongoing discrimination. So all of these, all of these examples are pathways through which discrimination affects mental health and explains why just a single incident of discrimination can provoke ongoing mental health struggles within the minds of those who are discriminated against. 
So I want to call for research-based intervention programs that address the impact of discrimination on mental health. And so specifically what the research says is that what does prevent against the impact of discrimination for minority group members is having a sense of pride in one's racial identity. And so interventions that focus on instilling pride in minority group members, emphasizing their historical contributions, uniqueness, and resilience as a group are successful for negating the impact of discrimination. Secondly, racism and discrimination contribute to a sense of loneliness and alienation. So individuals undergoing discrimination should be able to seek out community with others who are undergoing similar experiences. Ultimately, however, solutions that mitigate the impact of discrimination should address those that are more likely to perpetrate discrimination in the first place. Given that discrimination is often subtle, perpetrators are unaware that they are acting in a, in a racially biased manner, implicit bias trainings, which encourage awareness of subtle racial biases, may be helpful. Researchers Emerson and Murphy also outline a number of situational cues. So members of marginalized groups, when entering into spaces, they look for situational cues that they might fit into that space. So that can be artwork, the music that's playing. And one example is sort of having a critical mass. Folks that are from marginalized groups, they walk into a space and they say, are there other people here who look like me? And the answer to that question affects how they show up in that space subsequently. So that's a situational cue. So we need to encourage spaces to have a critical mass of folks that have uh, marginalized backgrounds and also to have a critical mass of folks that have marginalized backgrounds at the upper echelons, not just at the lower parts um, within workplaces. And um, last, I think diversity statements within workplaces should value difference explicitly among employees and also indicate that individuals from the dominant group also have an identity and it is not just that they are the default. Um, last policy that addresses institutional racism and grants minorities equitable access to health care, education, and housing is critical for sustainable change. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I will also be sharing a toolkit created by psychologists that includes tips for people of color coping with discrimination. Thanks for that, for your research. Um, uh, greetings, uh, have my, I'm reading from this and then I have some additional points, uh, mostly in response to the previous panel that was uh, speaking earlier today. Uh, so my name is Lauren Quijano, I'm the community organizer for the Health Justice Program at the organization called the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, or NELPI. On behalf of NELPI, I thank council members for conducting this hearing and also for everybody here in the room for spending your time this morning to listen. Uh, NLPI is a nonprofit organization which advocates for civil rights. We aim to address systemic issues that communities face and emphasize the active role members of those communities play in addressing such issues. For the past 40 years, NLPI has been a leading civil rights and legal advocate for New Yorkers, marginalized by race, poverty, disability, and immigration status. NLPI's health justice program, the program that I work for, uh, brings a racial justice and immigrant rights focus to healthcare advocacy in both New York City and New York State. We provide expertise through our immigrant health initiative, utilizing individual and systemic advocacy to improve immigrant access to healthcare, including for those in immigration detention facilities right now who should not be in detention centers in the first place. We are also looking to work ahead in addressing mental health crisis, supporting community organizations, who have long fought to implement alternatives to policing, including having health workers to be the first responders to 911 calls as opposed, as opposed to the police being dispatched. Discrimination and bias through a racial justice lens is recognizing a system that is inherently set up to disproportionately target and negatively impact black and Latino communities and immigrant communities of color. Policing in these communities, including the community where I live, in Jackson Heights and Queens, is a major problem. Even as I reflect on the work that we do in immigration detention advocacy at NLPI, we cannot say that we are for ending detention without addressing the increasing levels of policing in communities that put people in contact with the criminal system in the first place. Discrimination and bias in housing, healthcare, access to counsel, education, and employment are all issues that the advocates and community organizers like myself of my organization see our clients having to face every day. 
Mental health services are trying to address issues that people have the human rights to. These human rights not being realized is what are causing the ever increasing need for more mental health services in the first place. The right to health care education, stable employment, food and water, all these necessities for human life is required. At NOPI, we try to address some of the issues having a huge impact on communities, including issues of transportation, lead in, in our water, mold and asthma, among many other issues. A huge function of that is mental health. So when I see a lack of health care for our clients, I see a lack of prioritizing human life. I see more efforts being made to privatize everything from housing to health care, which is really timely because the Amazon hearing is happening just right across the street. Then once everyday people draw attention to this matter in a public way, they are faced with policing. Policing in their neighborhoods, policing in schools, in healthcare settings, and even in their own homes. The, prior the priorities in fact are so blatant when advocates are calling for training the police and funding is routed towards training the police as opposed to providing mental health services for those who need them most as opposed to having community members and health workers who understand the community members and identify with the stresses of not having basic human rights realized and responding to people experiencing mental health crisis, the police are still the ones to respond instead. A few months ago, an LP filed a FOIA to access full body camera footage from the police in the shooting of a man in his home, a man who had a mental illness. Whether the police are trained or not has been a political and fiscal priority of the city, and not enough attention has been going to what community needs, including mental health support. This affects black and Latino communities for those who are undocumented and those who are documented, uh, to which we call immigrant communities. As a community organizer, it leaves myself and my community confused as to why we are having to fight and advocate for people's rights in a system that is inherently racist. This is what I experience outside my workplace, and there is fluidity in my work where this also affects particular workforce that I support and advocate for. We cannot leave things outside of work, regardless of our best ability to do so. For example, at NOPI, we are mindful of when photo identification is going to be required for a client to have access to a building where a meeting will be taking place. The requirement for photo identification can cause nervousness for a client prior too, like a likely very important meeting regarding their case. This is especially important for any meeting pertaining to someone's individual immigration case, along with other needs such as access to health care and mental health services. The same issue goes for language access for clients who are limited English proficient or need other accommodations to communicate needs and demands. Yet, when I am hearing about immigrants' rights to health care and other human rights as being too ambitious to pursue, that makes me question the very existence of my own family and myself being in this country, in this state, in this city as an advocate for its citizens. Through our work at the intersection of immigrant and health justice, we have witnessed firsthand the negative impact on the ability of communities to access services, including vital health care, that has been a direct result of policies that target and undermine black and Latino and immigrant communities from thriving. The immigration detention centers and county jails where ICE contracts at the end of the day are the same jails, arrests facilitated by the same police force, and the bodies that fill them are our community members who have always had difficulty accessing services that are supposed to secure their basic human rights. So how can they then be expected to have to access the same services inside a jail, right? Our work acknowledges this harsh reality and we look forward to advancing the advocacy efforts of communities who have been demanding change to survive. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have about Nopi's work. Um, and I say this testimony also reflecting on what happened to Jasmine Heatley, um, who as I understand charges were dropped, yet I, I believe um, Jasmine is still uh, uh, being confined by law enforcement. And you know, to be honest, I used to work for HRA um, myself. I used to be a tenant support specialist for the mayor's office. Um, now as an employee for HRA, we would go to buildings, we would door knock, we would try to do all of the work that everybody talks about, connecting people to access services. And what was really hard for me as somebody who had to stand in rooms full of mold, full of mice, full of pests, with communities that can't see physicians because of all the intake processes or fears of getting arrested or all the many issues. It's like 
okay, so now I'm here, fast forward at this hearing, and the panel before me is talking about the ever long process to get support, to even access these services. And then when it really comes down to holding people that uphold discrimination and just ultimately racism, the answer to that is to have the NYPD come out and they don't even you know, arrest. So I'm, I'm honestly very concerned and curious as to the purpose of, of the Human Rights Commission. Um, even though I, I want to uphold human rights in my work, uh, as a commission, I'm, I'm really concerned about that and the fact that they are working with uh, community advocates and community partners with the NYPD to do this when the NYPD is an issue. Um, you know, ICE is an issue, policing in our communities just to be able to access resources that we don't have is an issue. Um, Mr. I, I, I forgot who was sitting there, Robert and Holden. Holden, Holden, excuse me. Yeah, Mr. Holden was talking about his wife having to be in a community that's predominantly white and all the discrimination that she faced. And again, the hearing happening across the street about, you know, Amazon coming into Queens. And again, I live in Queens. Uh, it's not a question as to why communities are so segregated. You know, it's not a question as to why there are all of these barriers that make it really difficult, even for me as a community organizer, to support people in my own community. And I think it's really telling that we're combining this Commission on Mental Health to be with the Commission for Human Rights, and because that's, r that's really what this is. But what I'm alarmed at is how so much of the rights to access service and access care is so tied to the policing in this city. And honestly, it's to the point where, yeah, I'm speaking up for myself and for my own community here. This is what it is. Um, it's not just discrimination anymore. This is blatant when the decision to increase policing is so connected to accessing basic services. So um, that's my spiel. Um, you know, to be honest, for, for many folks in my community, this is life or death. I'm Filipino. There are a lot of undocumented Filipino workers that are having to work as, as home health aides, as domestic workers. Uh, we don't even know where all of them are. We find out where they are once there's some type of just egregious abuse that happens, uh, including people with disabilities, workers with disabilities. And, you know, people are getting hurt, seriously hurt, and people are also dying. Um, so there are a couple of cases that we highlight at NILPI um, of this happening. Uh, but really, you know, I see this on a systemic level. I, I've seen this as an individual. I've seen this as an advocate. And I bring up the fact that I used to work for HRA because it's like, how, how can you try to help someone that's going through, through something like that when they're surrounded by all of those police? It, 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 I just don't expect how training could possibly help with that um, as a previous HRA employee. And I have to say, I was trained to be a facilitator for the mental health first aid under Thrive NYC. I love the initiative. When I first heard about it, I was like, oh my gosh, I can use this information as a non-doctor, <laughs> right? Information that's really hard to get, I'll be able to understand it and I could share it with other Filipinos in my community. But then the problem that I have is at the very, very end when it comes to addressing crisis, it still says to call 911 and to call the NYPD. That's part of the mental, like the, the most praised mental health um, alternative, you know, community-led driven system. And, and then there, now that I'm at NILPI, I'm learning there are actually a lot of issues with Thrive NYC because you can't even get access to a health provider unless it's like within 24 to 48 hours. But in crisis, that doesn't work. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best that I can, making the connections where they can be made. I, I reject a lot of the solutions that were brought up in the previous panel um, as somebody who's part of the community. And I just wanted to bring light to that. And I hope that you all can, you know, take my card. Uh, feel free to uh, ask me what I think is, is best. But I'm going to just center my work on what the community voices have been saying. Thank you. Wow. That was, <coughs> that was great testimony. Thank you guys so much for being here and helping us to shine a light on, on a lot of these issues. Because we need to first, you know, speak them into existence, right, so that then we can recognize that they exist. And I don't think that we do that uh, well enough. Um, but I, I so appreciate your testimony. 
Um, I, I agree. I think we, you know we we over police our way out of you know uh, out of everything. And in our, my district, we're opening a, a diversion center, and a lot of people were really opposed. But I actually think it's a really great thing. It's a great tool, um, and I'm hoping that it's a successful tool and that we're able to replicate that. But it doesn't cover you know all areas, and I, I, there's a lot of work that has to be done. But I want you to have confidence in us, and this is exactly why you know we're we're having these hearings. It's because we want to do better as well, and we want to be able to hold the city agencies accountable, and we want to help them be better. Um, Adina, I had a question uh, for you. So given that, that, that the community that you describe is very insular and can be uh, disinteresting, uh, disinterested of outside organizations, how can the city do a better job of reaching out to those individuals that may be suffering um, with building trust? I, I don't, I'm not sure. I just think that maybe anonymity um, would be helpful. So, um, some sort of um, a way that the people calling in or, or reporting can feel as though they're not gonna be requi you know, required mm -hmm. to appear somewhere or reveal their identity. Um, and just that safe space. So just taking into account that, you know, anti-Semitism is not necessarily yeah. something that goes on from an external nation to, to Jews. It sometimes happens within. And this just having this cultural understanding of the pressure to conform and not whistleblow might enable um, um, healthcare workers to, to better streamline the like, complaints that might be coming in with, you know, to help them. Mm -hmm. That's all. I'm not really sure. I don't know what the solution mm -hmm. is. So like you said, we have to just speak the problem into, into existence, existence. And, and then we'll, the process will hopefully help us find the solution. Yeah, correct. Councilmember Cabrera has a question. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for holding uh, this hearing. Apologize, I couldn't be here earlier, but I was chairing uh, another hearing that took a couple of hours. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, let me work there, work it backwards uh, from my right uh, to the left. Uh, you mentioned uh, the mental health first aid, that at the end uh, the requirement uh, to call for uh, accounts, uh, to call 911, uh, but even counselors, licensed counselors, when there is a suicidal case or somebody's life isn't framed, we require, I say we because I'm a licensed mental health counselor, a doctor in counseling, um, we are require uh, to do the same. Uh, if somebody's life is in danger, and you're a doctor in psychology, I assume as well, you're required, so we're, we're mandated uh, reporters uh, why would that be a bad thing if it's required of professionals to do? I'm just curious. Why would it be bad to yeah. call 911? Yeah. Yes. Okay, um, that's a good question. So, <coughs> I mean, for anyone that's paying attention to the news right now, mm -hmm. and I mean, not just in New York City, but, you know, not even just Brooklyn, but <coughs> nationally, um, 911 is being called on disproportionately mostly black and Latino folks and minority groups or whatever you consider a minority. I don't consider a minority, obviously, but uh, yeah, black and brown folks. So um, it's being used in a way that I don't think is specifically meant just for emergencies. And then when it is used for emergencies and the police are dispatched, right? And we're seeing this with, um, particularly for uh, what we call uh, the em emotionally uh, disturbed persons or EDP calls, right? So uh, it would require an officer to respond to the 911 call if they think it's, it's and this is mental health focus, so I just wanna try to stick to the theme here. Mm -hmm. uh, respond to the 911 call, you have a police officer in theory who would go there and do an assessment, and then if the EDP call needs to be called, they'll make the EDP call, but then the officers that respond to that, uh, these are EDP officers that look like they're pretty heavily armed, pretty heavily geared up. They got the masks and the, you know, everything. And um, I mean, I'd be happy to also 
make sure that you see the video footage that I mentioned in my testimony. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very similar what happened in that call. Um, and you know, there was just a lot of yelling, just a, a lot of yelling at this person that, you know, they thought had a knife or a gun or a weapon behind them who wasn't responding to what they were saying. And I guess I could imagine that might be difficult to also deal with if you are a health professional. Um, I mean, it's scary, right? Because it's a different type of reaction. But the way I see the police officers in this video footage force a reaction out of this person, and then when they don't get the any type of response or reaction that they expect, um, the move is then to shoot that person. That's 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 an issue, and that's something that I'm seeing all across the news. I don't want to think of it as isolated incidences anymore because I think one of the reasons why we have uh, you know, commission partners putting a panel like this together so that we could talk about this is because it's not isolated anymore. Uh, so yeah, that's my issue with that. And to be honest, I think about this a lot. Like, okay, if the police don't respond, then who's gonna be able to protect the people? And the other day, actually, I was on the subway, and I even mentioned this with some of the staff at Nopi, I was on the subway and there was a man who had a knife, all right, who was ready, who was really angry, who obviously was, uh, had, a, uh, was, had a mental health issue um, because he was very angry and, and unable to really respond to cues in the way that folks were trying to help. And he got really upset and he took out the knife and he was about to stab some kids on that metro train. Um, I was very, very close. I, I don't wanna explain how close I was. I was very close and Sure, I guess in the immediate sense, the way that we're conditioned is to call 911 if there's an emergency, right? Uh, everything conditions us that, that way. I've been conditioned to, to think that ever since I was a child going through elementary school in the public school system here. And, um, you know, 911 wasn't called. People were still able to somehow make sure that nobody was hurt and injured in that way. Um, so, you know, it was very scary. I'm not saying that we then have to operate in our work with fear, but I would more so like to build with people, connect with people, really see how community members themselves are trying to protect life without having to shoot someone in order to do that. I so, hear you. Yeah. I, it just, I, I just want you to be aware that... Uh, that even people who have been extremely trained, that we are mandated, and there was a reason why there was a state law regarding that, is because there comes a time where lives are in danger, whether the person, you know, we're mandated if somebody wants to injure themselves or injure someone else to call the NYPD. I, I hear you that there's, there's a great need for better training in the NYPD. I hear you. I, uh, but I wanted to address that piece, why, you know, the administration has that in place, uh, because uh, we, we don't want to put people in a position themselves that could be over their head or thinking they can handle a situation that might be beyond their training or capacity, you know, uh, with, with they had just taken uh, the mental health for say. I'm running out of time because I know we got two panelists, but I want I, um, to address, address uh, Anima. Adina. Adina, Adina, I'm sorry. Adina, I'm, I'm always intrigued when it comes to religion and mental health. I'm a pastor as well. Can relate a lot to, to today's uh, hearing. Um, but you mentioned something here at the end of your testimony. And it's the same response uh, you gave to my chair that in a way where young people uh, could uh, basically be able to reach out to them in an anonymous way. Uh, right now we have ways that peop young people could call in just like in any other people group that we have in our community. But in, in terms of doing surveys or any studies, uh, I, I think your mom would agree with me, uh, having been of also a former director of a mental health program myself, uh, that there, there are rules 
And the rules require that there be consent from parents. So that puts uh, your situation in a very uh, kind of a no next step a position because of the parents, because you know, parents ultimately uh, in, in, in the United States have, uh, they have the rights over their kids. Uh, I, I understand, I'm, you know, I'm Christianity, and we also have Orthodox community uh, as well, uh, and so forth. Uh, but I'm also leery and wary uh, uh, regarding freedom of religion, uh, because at the end of the day, then everybody starts asking whose values are superior. Um, and at one point, young people reach an age where they can make their own decision, just like I made my own decision regarding my religion uh, at a certain age, uh, and was able to make that decision. So I, just for us to work, to walk very, you know, with be not only culturally sensitive we're talking about here, but also when it comes to religion, we need to be very sensitive as well uh, because that's their practice, you know. Uh, just like you have other communities where they have practice and some are more open than others. The, the, out, the results that has, the, um, some of the testimony you mentioned, it's the same testimonies. I worked in a public school that I hear with kids who are not in that situation and they deal with the same issue. They're, you know, they have anorexia, they have drug problems, uh, they have numerous other problems that we have, and they're not involved in a close uh, net, uh, religious uh, setting. And I'm not endorsing or condoning uh, the community. What I'm saying is, uh, let's, you know, when it comes to religion, I'm very, very careful because I, I don't want us to tell one religion, you got to have these certain practices. Uh, and lacks your rules regarding certain things. If there's a crime being committed, there's something legal being committed, uh, that definitely needs to be followed through. That should not be tolerated by, you know, we have laws in the land, uh, it should not be tolerated, and it should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And so with that, I close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have a really hard close here. We have to be out of the room by one. So we're going to be calling the next panel, and there really isn't a lot of opportunity for questions. So we're going to allow you to have two minutes on the clock uh, for your testimony. <coughs> My apologies for that. We didn't realize that we had to be out by one. Um, Catherine uh, Hansens, Jean Ryan, and Catherine uh, Bujon. You can begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. You can begin. Thank okay. you. Is this on? You can just press the button. It's Thank usually you. red. I think it's red. Is that on? Yeah, yeah I okay. can hear you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I can do this in two minutes, but I'm sure going to try to do it in as few as possible. Uh, I, I'm Catherine Hansens. I'm the uh, director and founder of the Center for HIV Law and Policy. I have been working in the field of HIV law and discrimination for nearly 35 years, so before some of you were born. Uh, my comments reflect the experiences of people living with HIV who are on the margins and who, because they are low income, either rely on or are disproportionately ensnared in the criminal detention, foster care, and publicly funded healthcare systems. And I, I know I'm short on time, but I really did want to thank the uh, the drafters of the excellent briefing paper. I found it very helpful. 
and I thought it provided an excellent frame for the hearing, and in particular because you ended on an issue of health care discrimination, and that is going to be the focus of some of my comments. I'm, not, I'm going to skip over the portion of my testimony that talks about all the evidence of discrimination and the impact on mental health. When I was discussing this with staff about does discrimination affect mental health, there was kind of a, um, really? Are, are we really asking that question? Um, I think um, the, it's, pr it's obviously well established, and one of the, the studies that I found particularly distressing is that among black, Latino, and Mexican Americans, there is not only a measurable impact on mental health, but it appears to get worse the longer they're in the United States. In other words, the experience of discrimination and what they discover is discrimination in this country in, uh, causes increased mental health problems the longer they're here. They don't decrease, they increase. Um, the experiences that teach and reinforce the self-perception that one is less than is strong fertilizer for feelings of self-loathing. And for people living with HIV, that also translates into a disinclination. Does that mean my time is up? Oh, no. You want to summarize? You want to finish can, real quick? Can I just have a minute to, to jump to the end then? Really quickly, go ahead. Um, there is... Uh, I know you all can read. I hope you'll read the testimony. We will read the testimony. It actually isn't that long, but I'm hoping that um, that in addition to talking about some of these issues, that the uh, committees will come up with some very specific recommendations that address uh, the problems of bias and discrimination in the healthcare setting. Um, I highlight those in my testimony, but what I want to underscore is um, increasing the role and funding of peer navigators and counselors to support patient engagement and monitor the cultural capacity of primary and ER care providers. There is lots of evidence not only around the country but in this city that the problems of disparities in terms of who is being diagnosed and treated for HIV in this city is closely connected to the what is really a, an unconscious bias uh, and actual, uh, I think, racism and classism among the providers uh, on whom people living with HIV who are in the margins disproportionately rely. Thank and, you. And thanks for the chance to say something. Thank you. Uh, I'll talk fast. <laughs> um, I'm Catherine Boughton, B-O-U-T-O-N. I'm the uh, president of the Hearing Loss Association of America, New York City chapter. We represent um, people with hearing loss who rely on accommodations that do not include ASL. ASL is for the deaf community. We are people who were lost our hearing after we were verbal. Uh, we need these captions that you have provided, this, this, which is very um, welcome, and the, the caption provider probably knows how much, uh, how much we need these. I couldn't even hear when my name was called. Um, what I want to talk about just very briefly is uh, New York City has a large elderly population. We have a large poor population, and that means that we have a large portion, statistically speaking, of people with serious and, in fact, even disabling hearing loss. And I hope you just read the statistics in my report. Um, what I want to say here is that the consequences are very serious for those people and for the costs of mental health um, provisions in New York. Uh, hearing loss is associated very strongly with depression, social isolation, paranoia, and most importantly, cognitive decline, including dementia. So what am I recommending that you all do? This is not a case of conscious discrimination most of the time. It's, it's unintentional. Um, what I want to say is that if everyone um, should keep in mind that when you want to communicate orally, if there are any people in your audience who have hearing loss, and undoubtedly there are, whether you know it or not, um, it also has to be communicated in writing. If you have a public address system, you also need to have captions. If you um, are, have microphones at a community board meeting, uh, we need these same kind of cart meetings. We can't call 911 
I can't call 911 because I can't hear the response from the 911 operator. So we need text 911. We also need first responders and emergency room personnel to know what a pocket talker is. It's a very, very inexpensive device that if somebody comes in disoriented, it may be partly because they don't have their hearing aids, they, they lost them. So a pocket talker allows uh, a, a healthcare worker to communicate with that person and maybe not send them off uh, as diagnosed as having dementia but merely having hearing loss. So um, pencil and paper is my last suggestion. People should always be willing to write things down. Um, finally, um, don't ask if someone has a hearing problem. Very, very often they don't even realize it themselves. They think they're just getting old and that hearing doesn't matter and that it's not correctable. Uh, it does matter. It's great for your mental health. It is correctable. Um, just assume it that they have hearing loss, especially if they're seniors, and act accordingly and provide these very, very simple kinds of accommodations. Thank, Thank you for you. having Did me Did you here. submit a copy of your testimony? I have to read the... <laughs> oh, I do have a copy of the testimony. I'm sorry, they're all over there on my chair. I have my 22 copies. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. It, I'm clueless. It's on. It's on. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm Jean Ryan. I'm president of Disabled in Action. And I had the same reaction that you did. Like, well, of course, bias and discrimination affect everybody's mental health when they're experiencing it it and later and um, so that was my first thought when I was writing my testimony where, where people with disabilities are very negatively affected by discrimination and bias and we're not it's everything is so institutionalized that it's not even thought of that it's bias or discrimination we can't take the subways Oh, well, they're old, it's expensive, you know, or, but we can go to a brand new healthcare facility and are there scales where we can get weighed? No. Are, are there high counters like this, like downstairs, where you can't even see the person behind? And that is the law that it has to be 36 inches. But they'll have something, they might have something that's 36 inches, but it has a barrier in front of it also that's added to that 36 inch height and there'll be a computer right there and you won't even see the person. I came to register this morning downstairs. We couldn't even see each other. It was almost funny but it's not funny because it happens all the time. That people think they have to build these really high counters. What do they need the privacy for Pete, for Pete's sake, you know? We don't see their computers, that's on the other side. So, you know, those kinds of things, and um, it, it just happens all the time. And are there exam tables? They, they buy new exam tables. Are they accessible to people with dis physical disabilities? No, they buy inaccessible exam tables. And when I was listening to the panelists, the original panelists, I was thinking, what a bunch of hot air. I'm sorry, but they spent way too much time saying, we're working on it, we're working on it. When the de health department could go out and they could decertify and not certify all kinds of hospitals and health uh, you know, um, outposts because they're not accessible. And th there's just so many things, getting an apartment, um, people saying things as we're going along the sidewalk. Oh. Do you have a license for that? Oh, you're speeding. You know, oh, can I sit on your lap? This happens all the time. These are not people we know that we're just joking about with, you know. They're just it, anybody on the sidewalk saying things to us or going to a community board and can't get in, can't get in or going to your office holiday party and guess what? It's inaccessible. You're the only one who's all dressed up and has to go back home because you can't get in. The New York Police Department is having community policing be a high priority now. In my neighborhood in Bay Ridge, 
they're having meetings for people who live in, they've broken up the area into different sectors. Well, the meetings are inaccessible to people who use wheelchairs or who have mobility disabilities. So really, we can't even participate. And then they're talking about, oh, well, we're trying to cooperate and everything and get everybody, you know, feel comfortable with the police. How can we feel comfortable with them when they're not even holding a meeting in a meeting in a room that we can get into? We can't even get into the whole building. So th there's just so many things like that. I, I assure you that we will read the entire testimony. I promise as the chair of, of, of the Disabilities Committee that I will review it personally um, because I think you have a lot of really great recommendations and I actually, while you're speaking, I have like a whole bunch of ideas for hearings on, on, a, on a couple of other issues, but I think our next, well. Don't put it on a snowy day. We will not do it on a snowy day, I promise. It'll be spring and beautiful. Thank <laughs> okay, you so much great. for your testimony. I have Thank it. Thank you. And I will read it. You're welcome to reach out to me or anybody in our organization. We're happy to attend anything, you know, and speak up. And, you know, w I mean, our physical barriers are horrible. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We're calling our last panel. We have five minutes. No, we're okay. Thanks. Let me just turn it off. How do you turn this off? Albert Cam. Um, Gadir uh, Addy, Lucille Freeman, and I want to recognize that Councilmember Rodriguez is here. Okay, I, I'm just gonna rush through this. Um, I just wanna thank you all for inviting community-based organizations to comment on the negative consequences and discrimination bias incidents uh, that, ha that are uh, uh, on our community members. My name is Gadir Adi, and I'm the Director of Child and Family Wellbeing at the Arab American Family Support Center, AAFSC, and I work with individuals who are experiencing stress, anxiety, and depression within targeted immig uh, immigrant and refugee communities. Uh, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities are under attack. This past May, AAFSC hosted the launch of the NYC Commission on Human Rights Support and Discrimination Against vul uh, Vulnerable Communities in New York City leading up to and following the 2016 presidential election. Um, some of the uh, report findings were shared earlier, so I'll kind of brush over that. Um, uh, even with these disturbing statistics that were reported earlier and some here on this paper that you can read, we hear from community members every day about physical and verbal attacks made against them in particularly xenophobic climate. We recently supported a young woman who was afraid to leave her home after someone on the street forcibly removed her hijab. Another community member experienced vandalism. The tires on his car were deflated and racial slurs were spray-painted spray across the vehicle. These community members are experiencing depression, anxiety, and are, are being treated at our center. In addition to a heightened risk for experiencing depression, Im immigrant community members face multiple challenges in accessing serv service services, including language barriers, limited education resources, and difficulty navigating an unfamiliar social service and healthcare system. Understanding these compounded issues, AAFSC developed the Mental Health Initiative. We now have two mental health clinicians and three mental health specialists on site to offer uh, support services to youth, adults, and staff in a culturally, linguistically competent manner. Each case requires a high touch point of service uh, with clients meeting clinicians regularly over a period of nine to 12 month, months. Youth are particularly impacted by rising uh, uh, discrimination and levels of discrimination and hate. Um, essentially, I just wanna welcome measures by the New York City to ensure that all residents, regardless of race, race, ethnicity, religious background, or status, are welcome, treated with, res with respect, and that acts of discrimination and hate are not tolerated. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, my name is Lucy Freeman. I'm here from the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project, which works to enforce the rights of low-income New Yorkers with mental health concerns, with the belief that people with mental health concerns are entitled to live stable and full lives free from discrimination. I'm going to read the portion of my testimony focusing on uh, the criminal legal system because that hasn't been addressed much today. Uh, the Mental Health Project also advocates for people who are receiving mental health services while incarcerated in city jails. The impact of incarceration on the mental health of an individual is incalculable. Living in a New York City jail means living day and night under constant threat of violence. It means separation from work, home, and loved ones in the community. For those who have survived trauma in their lives, which is the majority of our clients, incarceration means a return to fear, vulnerability, and the experience of victimization. Our clients report severe depression, anxiety, mood swings, and at times psychosis as a result of being incarcerated, among other diagnoses and symptoms. This matters on a human level, but it also matters on a policy level when we consider that the vast majority of people incarcerated in city jails are black, brown, and low income. In those terms, we can see that in the city jails, there occurs a daily mental health catastrophe, which has discrimination, racism, and inequality at its roots. Thank you for inviting us to testify, and we look forward to finding out how the City Council will address this issue. Thank you guys for testifying. I'm so sorry that we were so pressed for time, but I promise you that we will review all recommendations and that we will come back with a follow-up at some point um, to address a lot of the issues that were raised here today. Thank you so much. This hearing is adjourned.